Oh, there, now I see. We're all on different, different levels on my screen right now, so I'm searching for my colleagues. There we all are. We can get started then. Um, so I'm going to fix my screen. There, let's see. There. So good morning, everyone. Um, as you just heard, this meeting is being recorded and we're using remote technology made available to us through uh, Governor Baker's executive order that gave relief on the certain provisions of the open meeting law that's allowed us to convene remotely um, almost a year. Um, uh, Marker hasn't arrived until next month, but we've been appreciative of, of um, our ability to meet so nimbly uh, given uh, the pandemic and, and using this remote platform. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna get started, but I need to take a roll call first. So Commissioner Cameron, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am here. Great, thank you. Commissioner O'Brien. Good morning. Commissioner Zuniga. Good morning, everyone here. Great, and I'm here, so all four of us are here. We can get started. Um, today is February 25th. Uh, <clears throat> I'm calling to order public meeting number 337. I, I know that we have some, uh, at least one new face today. I'm looking forward to the introduction, but we'll start with our minutes um, and then turn to Karen for that introduction in just a few minutes. So, um, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, certainly. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I would move that the commission approve the uh, meeting, the public meeting on November 3rd, 2020 that are in the packet subject to any corrections for typographical other errors or other non-material matters. Did everyone have a chance to review them? Yes, I second the motion. Okay, great. Any edits, comments? All right, I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes, four zero. Tanya, thank you. Aye. Moving on. To yeah, Madam Chair, uh, as far as the November 5th meeting minutes, I know that you had um, expressed maybe wanting to take another look at these uh, and putting some more summation of commissioner comments. And I know we're trying to find the right balance between time step, et cetera. Um, I had called Director Wells to let her know that maybe my recommendation is on these, we hold off on these. Just take one more look to see if we want to put any more detail in and then bring them forward um, for consideration at the next meeting. So maybe I should just elaborate, uh, you know, we have, <clears throat> with, with the departure of Commissioner Stebbins, um, we've got a, a new commissioner who's helping us in the interim. We bought, and also Shara left, there's an opportunity for us to think about how we do the, the minutes. And I know that Todd, you're trying to reach that happy medium. The one thing I noticed, and I did, um, I remarked uh, offline to Commissioner O'Brien, is I noticed that there none of the input or comments of my fellow commissioners were noted. And I use that in some ways as a reminder of the issues that they may have raised. And so I'm, strike, I'm trying to strike the balance not to make them necessarily longer, but also not to take away maybe um, what is an important piece, which is the commissioner's interaction. So um, what was really clear was what was presented to us, and that's really helpful too. So I don't know if, if, if others felt that way. If we can certainly vote on these. I thought they were certainly accurate, but they just might not reflect the, the complete context of our discussion. No, I, I think when I got your um, communication, I, I'd had sort of the similar reaction in terms of we're trying to pare it down Maybe we went a little too far on that one. Um, so I don't have a problem at all. Maybe, you know, just talking to Todd and going through, seeing, you know, is there some way to even summarize the concept of the discussions that we as the commissioners had um, and then just bringing it forward in two weeks. That would be great. And, and, and again, maybe it's bullets rather than, you know, complete sentence, whatever is helpful so that the job isn't so grueling without 
I mean, I, I really like being able to look back, particularly on these meetings to say, oh yeah, Commissioner Cameron raised that point though, you know, and that was a reminder for me on how the, the discussion went. So thanks. Yeah, I, I agree that's that that is an important piece because that is where we discuss the issue and decide um, how to move forward. Quite frankly, I can't remember what I said either, so it's a reminder. <laughs> it, it may have been brilliant though. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Thank you, Commissioner. All righty. Um, so I, I appreciate that. And again, um, again, with the idea that I'm trying not to, to make it more, you know, more difficult. So thank you. So we'll, we'll table those. Is that the suggestion, Commissioner O'Brien? Yeah. Yep. All right. Then I think we can move on to our next item. Um, Director Wells. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, I, before we get into the uh, item regarding the update on the casino operations, I did have a couple of staffing updates that I wanted to give to you and to the members of the team and to the public. Uh, the first one is we are updating uh, Jill Griffin's role and her title, so I wanted to make the formal announcement of that, so congratulations to Jill. Uh, Jill had done an incredible job during the building and construction phase of the casino, the three casinos that we have in Massachusetts right now, and did a tremendous amount of work on workforce development, vendor development, diversity spend uh, for the casinos. And, uh, you know, as we're switching into a, a role where we have three existing casinos, Jill and I were talking about what sort of made sense uh, for her skill set, what made sense for going forward. And so what we've done is uh, adjusted her title so she is the Director of Diversity and Legislative Affairs. And I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of that, she, also that slight shift in the diversity role because a lot of what she was doing um, up until this point or earlier um, uh, in part of last year, you know, had to do with what the casinos were doing with their own uh, compliance and diversity efforts. Um, we're also looking, so we're looking to turn that inward on ourselves and really look at what we're doing for diversity hiring, diversity spend, diversity initiatives, just uh, for equity and inclusion for all our operations. So Jill has graciously agreed uh, to sort of shift to sort of her role uh, and not only continuing to deal with compliance uh, with our licensees, but also work with our internal team here uh, because we have great efforts that we've made in the past with uh, diversity spend and diversity hiring, uh, but just to refocus that, refocus that energy and have a point person that looks at that type of activity across the agency. Uh, and as you're aware, we do have the equity and inclusion working group, and there is a work plan uh, for that group. So she's tasked with a lot of uh, work in that area and spearheading some of those initiatives. So I think that's very exciting. Um, the other piece that she's going to be taking on and has already started uh, in an unofficial capacity uh, is legislative monitoring and policy. Uh, she'll be working particularly with the chair uh, in consultation with her and the commissioners um, you know, for research review, legislative tracking, legislative contacts, really working with uh, the government uh, and, and other aspects of what they're doing that affect our operations. So I wanted to thank Jill for taking on this new role, make the announcement. I'm thrilled. It's been a pleasure to work with her in these areas and it's worked out very well. So I'm very happy to continue that and just wanted to make that announcement. So I don't know if any commissioners have any comments, but I just wanted to make sure that was, pu that was publicly out there, especially since she will be the legislative contact for the commission. If, if I may jump in, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, listen, I had the opportunity to work with Jill in a selection process recently, and I thought she added great value to the team, uh, both with her work up front to make sure we had a diverse group of candidates to consider and in her role as a questioner and team member in making a final decision. I thought the input was invaluable. So I, I think that's an excellent, um, an excellent role for Jill to fill. And, and secondly, um, as far as the legislative uh, uh, responsibilities come, you know, we, we're just, we're dealing with sports betting and, you know, we just received a work product that was just excellent. And that's still in Crystal's work. So I uh, commend you, um, Executive Director Wells, for realizing her value to the team and elevating her into these new roles. Thank you. 
Any other comments? Commissioner Stinnecke? Okay. Yeah, I just just to echo those uh, those remarks as well. Um, congratulations, Jill. I I actually had planned. I, I'm I'm planning on talking a little bit more about um, this aspect as part of your evaluation, Karen. But I think in this environment in which we've had a couple of vacancies, uh, it's it's a great opportunity to redefine roles um, and you know step up to the plate in the case of Jill and 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 we think continuously about how can we make our organization incrementally uh, better and more focused on, on the things that, that come before us. So thank you for the for that creativity, yeah, both uh, Karen and Jill, and uh, you know, I know you're gonna do great. Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, just to echo what's already been said, um, that I've worked with Jill on some procurement projects as well, and was very impressed with her knowledge and her instincts and i also also would want to laud karen in terms of you know we've had some departures and some restructuring and i do think it's a really good fit in terms of skill set and then what we need going forward in both diversity and legislation so the title definitely fits with what she's been doing lately so it's it's a good it's a good change and i'm i'm very personally pleased uh i had identified really two years ago the need to have someone a point person for our legislative um, affairs and uh, with all that has gone on over the last two years um, i'm thrilled that now we've identified just the right person to fill that that position so karen thank you and uh, jill thank you for agreeing to take on um, that responsibility uh, jill has an extensive um, extensive experience working on thorny public issues and, and advancing important public interest. And she also has, um, you know, no, no secret, such a gracious manner uh, that will be so helpful to us um, as she works with critical external stakeholders. And she also has, um, living in, in the city and working in the city, you know, just an extensive network of relationships that, uh, that they all are, admire her and, um, and support her. So that speaks volumes as to uh, what I imagine will be her success in that legislative affairs position. And um, again, I echo uh, the others with respect to the diversity work. Um, Jill showed such success with her, with Crystal in partnership on holding our licensees accountable. And now I know that she will do the same for all of us. So um, we appreciate you taking on those two critical roles. Really exciting, isn't it? I just am very, very pleased for you, Jill, on sort of your professional um, own platform, but very happy for the agency. So thank you. Wonderful. Jill, do you want to say, say anything? Or I know you're on mute now. There you go. Um, well, first, I'd like to thank Executive Director Wells for letting me try out this new role first. Um, I, I think I'm really um, going to love it. And um, I think it's a really good match for my skill set and experience. And I look forward to just contributing to the commission in this um, expanded role. So, so thank you all for your kind words. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jill. Uh, so along those lines of, of staff announcements, I have another introduction I would like to make today. I am thrilled to introduce everyone to attorney Caitlin Monahan, who is starting uh, started on Monday as Associate General Counsel in the Legal Division, working for General Counsel Grossman. Uh, I had experience working uh, with Caitlin at the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, so I do know uh, her intelligence and her work ethic are uh, bar none. So she is uh, an outstanding young woman. Uh, we're thrilled to have her on board. Uh, she comes to us. She's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Uh, before law school, she did work on the um, Murray uh, governor, the lieutenant governor campaign, uh, working as a deputy press secretary. And then she also worked at, the, as I said, the Massachusetts Office of Public Safety and Security uh, before going over to Harvard for law school. Uh, and then she did a couple of internships, one at the United States Attorney's Office and also at the Middlesex District Attorney's Office, which we have several uh, prestigious alumni here at the uh, Gaming Commission. 
Uh, and then after law school, she spent uh, over nine years working at the law firm of Wilmer, Cutler, Pickering, Hale, and Door. So she has a combination of public sector experience and big law firm experience. So she really is a huge addition to our staff. And we are thrilled to have her on board. I personally am thrilled, not only because of all the um, sort of work things that she brings to the table, uh, experience and uh, her work ethic, as I mentioned, and just she's highly intelligent, but she's also uh, a wonderful person and she is just a great addition to this team. And that's really important in, in our community to have these uh, new hires be people that uh, are people that we would like to work with. And I know everyone's gonna enjoy working with her. Uh, and she's also, she's a, she really is a, at her heart of public servant. She has always wanted to come back into public service and work in government. Uh, so we're thrilled that she chose us to, when she made her transition back to public service. So welcome, Caitlin. Uh, and I wish you could meet everyone in person and everyone could meet you, but at least now everyone's seeing your face <laughs> and we're sort of getting started that way. But welcome aboard. Uh, you're very lucky you have a wonderful boss and Todd Grossman. So we're uh, no, we know that you're going to enjoy that job, and there's never a dull moment at the Gaming Commission, so I think you're going to enjoy it. So welcome aboard. Um, and I know that some of the commissioners, I don't think I've even met Caitlin at this point, so here they all are. You can see their faces, and I'm sure we'll have contact. And, and Karen, I think that you're, you may be setting up a meeting so that each of us can meet with Caitlin yes. individually. Yes. We want to make sure to do that with this virtual world that we're living in um, yes because we can't just pop into your office I have a, a, a connection with Caitlin that she may not remember or know but um, my husband and Caitlin worked together until her joining us and um, Caitlin uh, made a bid on a silent auction item and won it <laughs> and that was to get a tour a kayak tour from a home in Winchester down the Mystic River by Encore all the way into the Boston Harbor with a group of maybe six other kayaks. And my husband and I were to be her tour guides. So we still owe you a kayak. Um, <laughs> I think COVID got in the way, the pandemic got in the way, and that, um, that trip that a lot of people do um, just didn't happen. So <laughs> um, I had asked my husband, no, do you know Kaylin? He said, yes, we owe her a kayak trip. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Looking forward to working with you, Caitlin, and uh, I know Todd and Carrie are very happy to have you join. Um, it, it's a, a busy legal office, and, and uh, it's as much as they were doing everything so well, the extra hands are really going to be appreciated, right, Todd? Yeah. And Carrie is <laughs> nodding. <at her> <laughs> Carrie's <head>. nodding. <laughs> right. So commissioners, um, I, I assume that you you would all like to have, um, maybe Jamie could set a, um, a meeting up for each of you to, to meet Caitlin, great, thanks. Look forward to it. Yep, so Caitlin, welcome aboard, okay? Sounds good. All right, so uh, for the next item, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Director Lilios and Assistant Director Ban to go over the uh, status of the operations at the casino during the pandemic. So I'll start with Loretta. Okay, thanks, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. And Jill, congratulations. And Caitlin, uh, great to meet you and uh, look forward to getting to know you uh, in the days uh, and weeks and months ahead. So uh, since the 25% uh, capacity limit was lifted on February 8th, the three licensees have been operating under the capacity limits of 40%. They continue to be open on a 24 seven basis and all of the COVID related health and safety measures remain in place. Uh, this has meant they have been able to bring some staff back from furloughs. It has meant the reopening of the hotel at Encore and the scheduled reopening of the MGM hotel uh, next weekend on a limited basis. Uh, they have stayed within the 40% number and uh, Assistant Director Band will give you some details of operations. I did want to mention uh, one aspect with the hotel at Encore, that they have continued to monitor the actual occupancy of the hotel rooms themselves to make sure that guests are not misusing them for, to congregate. Uh, months ago, you may recall, we reported to you that they put in measures to monitor uh, the 
actual room occupancy start starting with their communications to guests the issuance of fines to guests who violate room limits and the use of security and surveillance measures to uh, monitor uh, we expect that mgm will continue continue that type of monitoring when their hotel reopens next week. And to date, there have been no significant issues of concern uh, to note on that score. Uh, I know Bruce uh, has some prepared remarks uh, for you, so I'd like to turn it over to him at this point, and uh, then we can try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Laura. Congratulations, Jill, and welcome aboard, Caitlin. I'll start out with that. Uh, as far as the occupancy numbers, uh, since we've gone to 40% and since I uh, last reported last, uh, during the last meeting, at MGM, they have a, a high occupancy of 1,533 and an average high occupancy of 920 daily. Uh, Plain Ridge Park has had a high occupancy of 1,115 and an average high occupancy of 788. Encore has had a high occupancy of 3,192 and an average high occupancy of 2,306. Uh, they've had a great occupancy level on their hotel at Encore since opening. Uh, other than that, the restaurants and uh, stores have been busy. Nothing really significant to report as, uh, as anything being really problematic uh, at any of the three hotels. Uh, I'll address any questions or anything anybody has. Director Bam, do you know what um, percentage of the 40% those numbers uh, end up being? Uh, at, actually, uh, for, for instance, at Encore, uh, their total level is 7,000 permissible, so the high is 3,100 and something, so they're not even uh, uh, reaching, you know, 50% of their 40%. So okay. that they're well within the, in the numbers, and actually that high level happened to be on their uh, Lunar New Year celebration. So that was a sat Saturday when they had the, the traditional dragon dance and so on. Thank you. You're welcome. And Bruce, this is Commissioner O'Brien. Do you um, could you just comment too in terms of whether there's any concerns or anything you're seeing in terms of bunching at elevators either to get to the parking areas or up into the hotel at Encore? We we, we have not had that problem with congregating uh, around. They have kind of worked out that uh, uh, the problems mostly stemmed when we had the 9:30 closing and everybody had to exit the building at once. And now that we have the 24 seven, people kind of uh, exit at their own time, so to speak. So that really hasn't developed into a problem. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Seneca? Yeah, well, actually, I was just, this was just gonna be my question. Um, as you look back on, on the period in which you are now a 24 hour operation, is it fair to say that you know those averages that you that you describe are spread out more throughout the day and limiting the the concern for congregations? Yes, uh, I I think that the heavier numbers are, are more, of course, from nine thirty to to you know one in the morning, which is always a, the busier hour at a, at a casino hotel. Uh, it you know the numbers don't su surprise me. Uh, we're actually trying to uh, uh, kind of spread out our number taking when we, we pick the heavier numbers. So I, I think going forward, our, our numbers will will look maybe a little bit different, but uh, the, the numbers don't surprise me with, with, and I don't think that we'll really have any problems going forward. Right. And I, I, I remember you on a, on a prior update mentioning that uh, we'd have to monitor, um, you know, promotions, uh, et cetera, that tend to bring more people um, at, at a particular period of time. Has that been, uh, you know, uh, difficult to do or, you know? Yeah, we, we get a list of all the promotions, so we, we know when they are and, and everything. Like I say, this at Encore happened to be during the, uh, you know, the Chinese New Year. And 
uh, that didn't really cause us any any problems. Uh, uh, like I say, they even had the traditional dragon dance, uh, uh, and they scaled that down for for social distancing as well. They uh, only had two people in the dragon, for instance, so they could stay six feet apart, uh, and that didn't even come close to approaching uh, occupancy levels. Plus, to be fair, they do the promotions at times that is, you know, very low occupancy, exactly for that reason. Yes. To try to bring them in. This time. Overall, Bruce and, and uh, Loretta, in terms of uh, mask wearing, social distancing, and all the other COVID restrictions, your uh, compliance, you would say, is, continues to be very strong? Yes. Yes. If, if they have somebody that's non compliant, they they don't keep them in the building. <laughs> you know, they're, they're very stringent about that. Any further questions for Bruce and Loretta? I see. All set. Excellent. Um, thank you. As, thank you. Al as thank always, you. Bruce, thank you so much. And Loretta, Are you, Loretta, do you have other points that you need to raise? Uh, no, that, that was it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then we're going to move on to item number four, um, update from um, our community affair division chief, Joe Delaney. There you are. Good morning, Joe. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, so today we have for you the MGM Springfield fourth quarter report um, from MGM. We have uh, Seth Stratton with us, uh, Dan Miller, Arlen Carballo, and uh, Jason Randall. And I will turn it over. To, I think I saw Seth on here, so I'll turn it over to him for the fourth quarter report. Actually, Joe, it'll be down to me uh, to, to start this off. Um, and I, I do have one request of you. Uh, we, we did have some technical issues logging on this morning. You know, what, what kind of uh, video meeting would it be without technical issues uh, at this point <laughs> in the game? Um, we, we've come in through the application on our phones. So the one thing I cannot do is run through the slides of the presentation. Uh, so may I ask you to, to bring that up at all? Look at that. Got it sitting here, we're sitting here waiting. Ask and thou shalt <laughs> receive. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. Very impressive, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> always planning for the, uh, always planning for the uh, technical difficulties. There you are. Um, so, so just to begin, uh, as Joe said, we have four presenters for you today, much the same as it was for the last quarter uh, report. Um, and, and we'll start off with Arlen and her uh, revenue updates and, and the taxes into lottery, and then she'll hand it back to me for my uh, uh, compliance side. Um, Arlen, are you on? Yes, hi, good morning. Um, I would actually like to start by introducing myself last time with our technical difficulties. I don't think I did that. Um, so my name is Arlen Carballo. I'm the director of finance here in MGM Springfield, and it's uh, really nice to uh, virtually meet all of you um, this time around. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, our gaming revenues and taxes for the fourth quarter were as follows. In October, we generated 17.5 million in gaming revenue and 4.4 million in gaming taxes. In November, our first month impacted by the curfew, we generated 10.5 million in gaming revenue and 2.6 million in gaming taxes. In December, we generated 11.8 million in gaming revenues and 2.8 million in gaming taxes. For the three months ending in December, we generated a total of 39.8 million in gaming taxes and 9.8 million, sorry, 39.8 in gaming revenues and 9.8 million in gaming taxes. For our lottery sales, our total sales for the fourth quarter were $204,712, a 48% decline uh, compared to the same period last year. Dan? Any, any questions, commissioners, before we move into the compliance? Okay. Um, so a, as you can see uh, with, with the slide that's in front of you, um, I obviously would like to uh, trend more towards all the zeros that are there, um, but cannot shy away from the fact we have some items in the, the miners gaming and even one receiving alcohol during uh, December. 
Um, uh, of course, that had to happen on Christmas Day. Um, you know, what, what other day should that happen on? Um, but we do take it seriously. We, we've gone ahead. Um, and in the last month, a small preview, more of this will be yet to come in our Q1 uh, in, in the next presentation, um, with an initiative that Seth actually spearheaded company-wide, uh, we rolled out instructor-led tips training uh, for all security, table games, food and beverage, um, and that went from the middle of January to the middle of this month. Um, so there has been a, a huge refresher and feedback uh, to the departments and the, and the officers um, to let them know, you know, we are serious about IDing, uh, making sure that we prevent uh, minors underage from getting on the floor, um, and, and we will continue with that nationally accredited program going forward. Um, any, any questions on this at all? Uh, uh, I had one. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner O'Brien, you first? Uh, yeah. uh, if I could, just quickly, I, I am curious going forward if, if we can delineate between underage and minors, uh, and I'm assuming, but if you can clarify for me, that the, the individual that got the alcohol was um, under the age of 21, but over the age of 18. Can you break down those couple of numbers any more than that for me in terms of 18 versus 21? Yes, my knowledge offhand is that they were 18, that person in particular, mm -hmm. and, and they were one of the people that gained, so it was, they, they did both okay. in that one trip. Okay. Um, yes, okay. and then the one other person was also either 18 or 19, one of those two, um, and, and they too uh, just gained on a slot, so. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cameron? Yeah, thank you. Um, do you have any more details? Is this an individual that just may have looked older, uh, or the two individuals and um, someone failed to ID this individual, or is, are there any other details? It's certainly, so, so the one particular individual that both gained and drank, um, I would say once I saw the photograph of them at the very entrance where we do ask them to remove their mask, um, that there could have been a question as to whether this person was under the age of 21. Um, where, where that's a bit of a, a fault on us is that our pol company policy is if they look under 30, they should be identified. Um, so that wasn't done, and that person then allowed, was allowed access. Um, but this was a young man that did have facial hair. Um, like I say, I, I think even if I passed this person, at least passingly, I wouldn't have immediately thought, oh, that, that's under the age of 21. But that shouldn't stop us because our policy is 30. Um, and that's, that's another part of what we're trying to instill more going forward, uh, also with the tips training, uh, is that it, it's if they look under 30, don't even think about it, both ID them and use the Veridoc system as well. I have, a, I have a, a couple of questions, Dan. Yes. Um, so on this graph says that there were two minors intercepted gaming and one intercepted consuming alcohol. Yes. Now, if I understand our rules, you can't consume alcohol unless you're gaming. So is the two, were the so, two minors intercepted gaming on um, one of them was consuming alcohol at the time? While gaming, yes. So that was what one person managed to, to do both at the same time and the other person just got to sit and game. So in fact, we're, when you see the two, it's two individuals as opposed to three individuals. Right, that's correct. Okay. Okay, um, and then if you could just, I just heard you starting to break down the TIPS um, program a little bit, could, and it was a little hard to hear you. Um, okay. Could you just tell me sort of the main components of, of the, um, this TIPS program, please? Certainly, so the TIPS program itself is, is the Nationally Accredited Alcohol Awareness Training Program. Um, th there's a lot of facilities, both governmental and private, that use this, um, and then also uh, restaurants and, and regular bars that, that you know serve alcohol. Um, up until recently, we had a corporate MGM program that was very similar and, and drew a lot of its uh, content from the TIPS program, but we weren't uh, using the actual uh, TIPS program. Um, like I said in the beginning, it was an initiative uh, that Seth here at Springfield spearheaded that we should at, at Springfield at least move to TIPS. Um, that way, not, not only is it nationally accredited, our employees get a certification out of it, so that helps them even if they should choose to go elsewhere. Um, and the other point of being the alcohol awareness and liability, um, they had this accreditation as opposed to just a company uh, awarded certificate. Um, so that was part of it. And he, he made a good enough case 
that they decided to adopt that company wide. So all of our MGM properties are now going to be using tips going forward uh, as, as the training program. And um, what I was saying is so up to this point, um, every employee that would be designated as, as a tips uh, related employee. So mostly that would be security. Um, that would be where, uh, table games and that would be food and beverage. Um, they've all received that training. They've passed it within the last month and uh, certification cards are now on their way from, from the TIPS program uh, to, to show that they're certified. Um, and then going forward, either when we bring back employees or if we new hire, they will go through this program as well if in those departments or, or a role that we feel should get TIPS programs. I went through the program myself in, in early February. And so if you had to say the top three skills that TIPS provides, that's going to address this issue that uh, on compliance, what would you say, Dan? Certainly. So the, the first one is identification of underage and, and then therefore prevention of, of one alcohol service, because that's what that is um, aimed toward. But doing it from that perspective, it helps us with prevention of also access to the gaming floor itself. Um, there, there is one fun slide that, that maybe we can bring to your attention in the next meeting uh, that is guess the person's age. There are it was either six or eight photographs of people um, and, and you get to guess, you know, are they under the age of 30? Because that's our, our policy. Um, and then determine all, every one of these people should or should not have been ID'd at the very entrance and then also for service of alcohol. Um, one of the other techniques is, is learning to, to witness the both psychological and physical behaviors of people as they consume alcohol. And so therefore we know when to rescind serving alcohol or, or at least taper off that, provide other options to people to prevent uh, any poten potential alcohol induced issues later on. Um, and, and then the third one is also making sure that these people remain safe. Um, after that, um, if there is a chance that a person could, in fact, indulge too much, we don't want to, you know, leave them in a position that they could get hurt or hurt others. Thanks. Other questions? Commissioner Zunick, I'm sorry, I, I, because I couldn't see you. I may have missed that you wanted to speak. No, thank you. Um, okay. All set. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on that? I'll set um, Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Cameron. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Turn it back over to Arlen now for our local and vendor spends. Thanks, Dan. Our total biddable spend for the fourth quarter was $5.7 million, and 5% of that went to diverse suppliers. I would like to highlight that we did have one of our local women-owned businesses graduate from our MGM Supplier Diversity, Diversity Mentorship Program. The program focuses on promoting relationships and inspiring diversity through the education of our suppliers. The program was six months long and it provided professional business development through hands-on guidance, as well as developing a lasting relationship with the MGM family. Any questions? You wanna move forward to the next slide? Our total spend for the fourth quarter was 6.2 million. Total spend within the Commonwealth was 5.7%, 38.5% in Springfield, 13.2% within surrounding communities, and 0.4% in Western Mass. Do we have any questions about our Did everybody have a chance to look at the graphs carefully enough? You're all set. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Commission. Jason Randall here. I'll jump in on employment numbers. Great to see you again. Um, as of 1231, our employment numbers included 891 total employees uh, who broke down to 53.9% as minority, 7.5% as veteran, 41.9% uh, women, and 37.5% as Springfield residents. And then our next slide shows the uh, breakdown um, as well as um, a percentage of our HCA number. And happy to answer any questions. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a quick question. Sure, Jason, um, 
I believe you had been uh, with your women, um, you had been in that 44, 45 range, and this appears to be a drop. Is that, um, do you have any idea um, why that is when it comes to rehiring folks, why there are fewer women coming back into the workplace? Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, and anecdotally what we see is women are home with their, their children. Um, really driven by that that homeschooling that's going on in the local communities and and not returning to the workplace when we're recalling. Okay, thank you. Hey, can I just follow up on that? In terms of recalling, I'm assuming is there a seniority basis in which you start calling people back in? Yes, we do recall based on seniority for the positions as well. Okay. And in terms of the women who, because of schooling right now, have to decline, do they, continue to sort of keep that seniority slot or are they moved back on the list in terms of continued recall? Excellent question. During our first round of recalls in the summer, they continued to keep that slot. Um, as we're recalling employees the second time, they're losing that seniority position. They oh, are? They are? Yeah, I mean, the, the employees um, were, were at a stage of recall employees that were part of the formal separations last summer. Um, so we're ap approaching a point where if we recall and they're not returning, you know, we're inviting them to reapply to a position with us when they are ready to return to the workplace. Is that, I guess that troubles me a little bit given what's going on, whether there can be any other accommodations. They do in fact have school-aged children that are causing that. Sure. I mean, our, our um, employee relations team does take each employee through a process to determine if an accommodation is available to them, uh, if it's an FMLA or, or whatever accommodation, you know, based on the person who had it on the list. So it's not uh, if they deny immediately if that that they lose that recall right, but we do through a process to discuss. So just to clarify for me, do they need to go through the process of reapplying, or are they simply then but later on a list for recall? Um, each scenario would, would be really dependent on the person and where they stand in the process and how many recall attempts we've had with them. Um, it, it's really dependent on, on case by case. And if I could jump in, Jason, I think one important clarification is, you know, that dep depending on position, there's different accommodations. Um, certainly, we're encouraging remote work and for folks whose job description allows them to be able to do that, we can offer such accommodations. Um, uh, as you're all aware, a very high percentage of our overall positions require um, in-person presence on property um, by shift on a regular basis. So it's um, the nature of the positions, such as security, um, dealers, EBS, etc. cetera, um, don't allow for the same flexibility for, for instance, remote working that, that um, other positions may. So with a very high percentage of um, in-person shift work, um, uh, you know, it's obviously a challenge that our industry and, and uh, many like ours um, have with respect to, you know, the, the challenges of flexibility um, that we've been discussing. May I jump in? I'm sure you'll probably pick up on this, but I guess my, my sort of lingering discomfort with that is my concern that it's one thing to then be put at the end of a list and say, you know, we've given you these combinations you need to put the end of the list versus having to go through the hiring process again or the application process again. I'm, a, I'm concerned people will be dissuaded in that scenario. Um, it's just my comment on that, and then I defer to Commissioner Cameron with her question. And, yeah. We can certainly take a look at that, and I, I think as a practical matter, um, someone who has, has already successfully been licensed and has been employed by us and knows the property and is trained would be a more attractive candidate uh, for sure during the rehiring process. Um, but I hear your question and concern around just that the incentive process or a disincentive if a reapplication um, process could could disincentivize someone from um, coming back. So, so we can um, we can look at that. We're happy to perhaps in our next presentation um, update update you on that um, uh, 
with additional detail on what we're seeing and what you know can be done to certainly that that women number has always been a focus of ours to try and get up to 50 percent and we don't want to do anything um, that would uh, make that more challenging in fact we we want to be continue to strive for success there so we'll look at that and follow up that'd be great yeah thank you Mr. Cameron? yeah so if i had i actually had the same concern which is i think this is not a normal hiring process right this is not business as usual i think this pandemic has really changed um and and you know the child care the child um, homeschooling has has been an issue and if there's a way that you can look at this differently than your typical someone leaves the workforce and then they would have to reapply during COVID I think that would be helpful not only to the women who right now it's a double whammy right they weren't able to come back because of their responsibilities and B they have to reapply to even come back and go to the bottom of the list um, I, I just think if there's a way to look at it differently as a company because your company does care about diversity and you do that and, and you have been trying to make strides to uh, to have 50% uh, of your workforce, but this is a such a unique situation. I'm wondering if you could take a look, and you know, possibly they're you know they're unable to work during this period, but you understand they'll be back in the near future. They were valued in team members, as you call them, and um, you know, if, if there's a way to take a look at that, Seth, I think it would be really helpful to you know, the company and to your goals of trying to um, achieve these diversity numbers. We certainly will. And we will, yeah. we will follow up um, before the, before the next meeting, you know, offline with staff, but um, we will look at that. Um, uh, we're in agreement that, you know, it's an issue that we want to make sure we're addressing and not, and certainly not disincentivizing the success on that. So we will. Yeah, um, I thank uh, my fellow commissioners for raising uh, and making these observations because uh, <clears throat> you know it's, it's a national story, right? The step back for women. I suspect too, it's a step back for minorities. So in your in your um, review, you, if this is um, this is actually important work not only for us because of course part of the expanded gaming acts. Um, goals is, is jobs, 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 and, and of course also employing women and minorities and vets. So it's, it, it is part of our review and part of our consideration, but it's also part of an important national story set. So any, any insights would be really helpful. And I would ask too, if you could look at the minority um, um, hires too. One, one issue I just wanna make sure I'm right on, um, and this might be a question for uh, Loretta, if she's on, um, or Karen, and, and, and Seth, you just may know it off the top of your head. If they have to reapply, but they were licensed, does that license stay? Is stays there any? Active. Karen? Yeah, it stays active. It does stay active. I wanted to make sure of that. I thought that was the case. Thank you. So I think um, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, we we this goes through Q4 of last year. Some of the exciting events that we did to stay active in the community. There's a few different ones. They all appear to have um, the holiday theme, um, which is the case. Uh, you'll see um, looking at the slide on on your the, the first large picture. Um, is a presentation of gifts that we made to the Ronald McDonald House in Springfield. Um, as those of you are familiar with the Ronald McDonald House, their mission is to, to have a, um, a safe and comfortable place for children and their families who are in the midst of medical um, experiences, um, requiring them to be within the proximity of our local hospitals. Um, when they're there over the holidays, making that experience for them um, you know, one that is celebratory um, uh, is something that Ronald McDonald House strives for, and we um, assisted in that by collecting and donating uh, a number of toys. You even see a few few bicycles. Um, the fun story there, Jose Delgado, who 
um, was our director of government affairs and I worked very closely with, closely with um, who has since um, uh, been stolen by the governor um, <laughs> to run his Western Mass office, which, which we're, we're fine with, um, but we miss Scooped him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he he um, literally went to uh, local stores um, buying, trying to find bicycles, which as you might imagine are hard to find. Uh, I'm sure you've heard there's like a COVID effect on bicycles. And so he, he drove all around Western Mass searching for bicycles and was able to find a few. Um, so that was um, exciting for us to be able to present. Um, you'll see as well the pictures of a large Christmas tree. Uh, that's the Christmas tree. Um, we moved it this year um, from our plaza to our um, Porcashire area near the um, near the garage, uh, and we did a lighting ceremony. Um, we couldn't have a lot of folks there, um, but we invited first responders and uh, city officials um, to celebrate um, the beginning of the the holiday season um, through that tree lighting. Uh, and then you'll also see um, the picture of um, Chris Kelly, our, our um, property president with the um, God Bless America um, sign behind it. That and the MGM um, sign in the far right corner. Those are both at the um, Bright Nights Forest Park um, uh, holiday lighting um, extravaganza that happens in Springfield. And um, one of the things we did on, on that day was we um, were able to provide um, several hundred tickets for um, uh, AMR first responders and PVTA drivers, two groups um, that we felt um, were working hard uh, to support the community uh, during this time and wanted the opportunity for them and their families to be able to uh, experience bright nights and so we were able to make that distribution of of tickets um uh through uh, pbta and amr representatives um and um, had an, an event um uh, announcing that at, at bright night so um all of these things are um more challenging to do in the COVID environment with the social distancing and the um you know outdoor gathering indoor and outdoor gathering restrictions but um we as a company have committed to continue to do what we can um, in this environment um, and supporting the community. And these are a few examples of um, our ability to do that um, during the winter and holiday season. Any questions? Commissioner? Not a, not a question, but a comment. You, you, uh, you continue to, to do great work in the community and this is just an example of that. In particular, um, really inviting the first responders was a was a really classy move and i think i'm sure appreciated for all the work that they're doing out there so good work thank you um next thank slide you. please so um as we typically do wanted to provide uh, an update on a few um items that are close to our project not necessarily um well, one is directly a part of, but the 31 Elm um, project, uh, as well as I'll talk briefly about Wahlburgers and, and the Armory. So 31 Elm, um, court square, former Court Square Hotel in the heart of downtown Springfield, as um, I believe all of you are aware, is um, has been a long focus of, of the company in connection with our residential development commitment. Um, we are supporting that development uh, financially, partnering with, um, uh, the developer, the city of Springfield, um, to bring that iconic property uh, in downtown Springfield back to life. Um, as I reported in the last quarterly report, the city was um, nearing completion of its um, mitigation and um, demo and, and remediation work. Um, the city has since completed that work. Um, I believe is in the process of um, transferring, formally transferring the property to the developer. Um, parallel path, the developer is moving forward on construction drawings, pricing, and bidding. Um, this project has, although the, um, the work that the city's done has moved forward, um, I think uh, on schedule, if not slightly better than schedule, um, there has been, there have been some delays in the financial close, we expected um, initially financial close to 
to occur this past fall, um, potentially early um, 2021. It's now expected, um, from what I understand, to happen in the spring or summer of 2021. Uh, and um, I do not have a, I believe the developer, and they'd be able to speak to this more directly than us, but I, I don't know what the current, you know, full construction timeline is and expected completion, I believe, as they move forward with drawings, pricing, and bidding over the next month or two, they'll have a better sense of the exact timeline of the um, construction. But um, it's uh, moving forward, no hiccups other than some COVID-related um, delays. And um, Wahlburgers um, mm -hmm. has, the, the construction is completed. It's waiting, um, the building is currently waiting um, to be activated. We're in constant communication with the Wahlburgers team. Um, they are in the process of figuring out when the right time to open for a successful opening is. Um, we um, are on track for a opening um, at some point in the spring of 2021. It's my understanding that the goal uh, of the Wahlburgers team is to be certainly be open by um, Memorial Day weekend. Um, which would be, you know, a, a big, um, uh, important um, event for and, and timing for the, the property to be open. So we're on track for that. Um, in terms of the armory, um, as you're aware, we're um, we have historically updated you on plans and programming of that facility. Um, given the COVID restrictions, there have been been no. Um, uh, uh, Activation. There has been no activation of that building, and we are um, waiting to see what um, you know what the timing is of um, the continued phases of reopening um, through the governor's office. And once we have a better sense of when we'll be able to reactivate that space, we'll be able to focus on what programming looks like moving forward. And. Uh and just to add one thing in on the 31 Elm Street um, development is um, we still are holding a bond from MGM for that amount of money that they owe to that project. So that was renewed back in the fall and is good through next fall. And obviously we will uh, maintain that bond until such time as um, that project, you know, uh, they go, to, they have their closing and, and transfer the property and then MGM makes their payments. Thank you, Joe, for that. Questions um, for Seth on his development updates. Um, yes, um, yes, uh, Seth. Um, just in general, the when it comes to the um, the thirty one Elm property, um, have you seen uh, um, any major changes because of uh, COVID relative to the feasibility of the project or the pace as, aside from you know restrictions of distancing and, and and whatnot i'm talking you know financing or or um or other major areas um you know we get we get kept in the loop by the developer i, I commissioner i can't speak for the developer um in terms of um the overall um financing and um I mean, there have been, there has been a time delay in terms of the financial close. It's my understanding that's more just logistics of general business slowdowns and meetings and things being more challenging to move forward. In this environment, I don't, I'm not aware of any um, uh, obstacles um, to continue progress that have been presented by um, um, COVID other than s some slippage of the timeline. Um, okay. But um, I, I, again, the developers would be best situated to um, provide any additional detail on that. They keep us in the loop and we're ready, willing, and able to satisfy our, our financing obligation um, as soon as we're told that the, the close is um, going to occur. Okay, thank you. Seth, it's hard to believe that Wahlberg's 
Wahlburgers has been built during COVID, I, I was at the groundbreaking, which I, I'm trying to remember what the date was for that. It, and and a, a year has gone by and it's ready to be open for customers. Yeah, it looks, it's beautiful inside. The, the team from Wahlburgers loves the space. Um, it's a great looking space. Um, they're excited um, about it. They're, um, you know, just as, as any um, food and beverage operator, including ourselves with our, with our um, um, venues that we run is, is, you know, nervous about when's the, you know, volumes, um, people's comfort level, when's the right time to, um, to open and especially with a, a grand opening, um, I imagine um, having starting out on the right foot and having that um, opening be successful is, is critically important for the future success. So um, we're, we, we've been very understanding and cooperative with Wahlburgers in terms of scheduling that for the right time and deferring to their expertise on when that opening makes the most sense because we're mutually vested in its success. So, you know, my takeaway, Seth, on this slide and on the prior slide where um, you showed the good work of um, charitable outreach, uh, <clears throat> something that I think all of us appreciate, um, but it's worth reiterating that uh, MGM is truly a community partner and, and um, an important component of the revitalization of Springfield. And the, this slide on the development update, particularly with respect to 31 Elm, shows that um, that commitment and, and the um, important component of the city's uh, vision for that revitalization. And we are all distressed that the pandemic has interrupted that great progress and I'm hopeful that um, as all the metrics point to the right direction, that that revitalization can start to hum again. So thank you for this update. Any other comments or questions from my colleagues? Uh, thank, yeah. thank you and thank you for recognizing that, um, um, Chair. The, that's a message that comes top down, um, both from Las Vegas and um, locally from Chris as our uh, local leader, that being a community partner and standing by our obligations to the community is is a top priority. So um, that's why you see us continue uh, to do that and will continue. So, so thank you very much. Appreciate the time today. Excellent. If um, there are no further questions for Seth and his team, uh, Daniel, and, and um, I wanna make sure I have Arlen's um, first name correct. Is, is that right? If, is it A R L E N? Uh, yes, that's correct. Arlen. Excellent. Well, and Arlen, thank you so much for your presentations and Seth, thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Moving on then to item number five on the agenda. Racing Division, Dr. Lightbound, good morning. Good morning. Uh, first, I wanted to congratulate Jill and uh, welcome Caitlin. I look forward to working with her. Uh, our first racing item today is an update of the um, Harness Horsemen's Association of New England's pension plan. As you know, um, the Mass General Law 23K Section 60 set up the Racehorse Development Fund, and 4% um, of that goes to benefits for the horsemen. Uh, for 2020, with the uh, delay in racing opening due to COVID, uh, we were only able to race 68 days instead of the anticipated 110 days. So um, managing director Alice Tisbert is here today to uh, show um, what they, how they updated their program for this. You know what, I'm going to, I'm going to um, interrupt our, our, our presentation for just one minute. Um, I missed a, a message from one of my colleagues and we do need to take a five minute break. So um, <laughs> I see you shaking your head. Thank you so much, I appreciate it and we'll, it is now um, 11 or five, we'll return, how about 10 minutes, 11.15, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lightbound, too, for your understanding. 11.15, thank you. Okay, I think we're all here. Thank you, everyone, um, for that uh, brief break. I'll do a roll call, Commissioner Cameron. I'm here. 
Commissioner uh, O'Brien. I'm here. And Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, here. And I'm here. And we're going to um, return now to item number five on today's agenda. And Dr. Lightbound, you nicely set the stage, but if you could reiterate that and then invite our guest again, please. Thank you. Sure. Um, briefly, uh, the uh, gaming statute 23K section 60 sets up the Racehorse Development Fund and 4% of that goes to the Horsemen's Associations for benefits for their members. And um, the Harness Horsemen's Association of New England has set up a pension plan, which has been before the commission before. Um, due to the COVID um, delay of racing this past summer in 2020, we only were able to race 68 days instead of the 110 that were planned. So the Horsemen's Association has changed um, the requirements um, for qualifying for this plan. And um, Managing Director Alice Tisbert is to describe that for you. And I'll turn it over to uh, Director Tisbert now. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Thank you and Dr. Lightbaum for allowing me time to give you an update on the Harness Horsemen's Association of New England's Retirement Savings Plan, better known as the RSP. As we're all aware, and as Dr. Lightbaum just stated, the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted so many aspects of life, included was the 2020 racing season. Along with the reduction in racing days, several states and racetracks imposed travel restrictions and the RSP committee realized it was gonna be difficult for an eligible participant to achieve a point or a portion thereof. With those concerns in mind, the committee recommended and the board approved the revised requirements and allowances for the 2020 racing season, which I hope you all have a copy of the uh, revised 2020 uh, requirements. And I also included a copy of the previous requirements. So uh, the highlights and the changes basically were a waiving of the minimum monthly starts uh, due to the racing, uh, reduced racing days, reduction in starts needed to obtain a point or a portion thereof. No loss of invested contributions for the 2020 racing season. And for those that didn't earn a point or a portion of the point, as well as vesting year credit, would be carried over to the next season without penalty. The only requirement that did not change was the membership requirement. And as a note, uh, by making this change, it prevented 13 participants from losing their unvested contributions, which would have totaled uh, around $150,605. So um, you can see uh, we needed to make this change and we were um, very happy uh, to do it. And I welcome any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Ms. Tisbert. Commissioner Cameron. Yes. Hi, Alice. Hi. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Uh, too. I know how hard you worked on this plan and how successful it is. And I think that the board acted quickly in recognizing that there was a need for changes this year. The changes all sound um, um, appropriate, certainly protecting the members from losing. If they were not able to participate, it's a really good thing. I'm sure your members are, are happy with these changes. Do you anticipate having to possibly adjust this year as well, depending on um, depending on how quickly restrictions are are lifted? That's a good question, Commissioner. I think I have to wait. I've talked to Dr. Lightbaum to be in touch with her for whatever requirements are going to be needed. And I we made we saw it right up front when we knew we had a reduction in racing. We were going to need a change. And I think we'll do the same thing. We're just going to have to watch. And we're very conscious of what it's going to take to keep everybody in the loop. And if we have to extend it, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. Great. Or if we have to make any changes, you know, in, in adjustments based on what's happening. All right. Great. Thank you for that update. My pleasure. <clears throat> any further questions for Dr. Lightbound or Ms. Tisbert? Thank you, Alice, Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Uh, and it's nice to see you virtually. We look forward to seeing you in real life, hopefully sooner than later. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank be you. safe. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lightbound? So our uh, next item on the agenda um, also deals with benefits, but this comes from a um, different part of the racing um, statute. This is actually in the racing statute. 
um, Mass General Law 128A and uh, 128C describe how the Mass Gaming Commission collects money from live simulcasts and account wagering and how that money is to be expended. <clears throat> uh, one way that that money is expended is uh, through health and other welfare benefits for active, disabled, and retired jockeys. Um, this is 128A, Section 5H. Um, with Suffolk no longer racing last year, um, there obviously isn't money coming in from live racing. However, there is still money. They still are simulcasting and, and um, doing account wagering. So there is still money coming in from those two sources. And um, this particular section mentions how all of the money comes in. So it wasn't, um, even though the uh, statutes in 128A, which is live racing, it did mention in that statute the money coming from the other sources from 128C. Um, in the past, the money that that, uh, the group that that money has gone out to um, has been the Jockeys Guild. They're a, um, you know, national group, um, well known <clears throat> and respected. Um, and um, if the commission decides that the money can still go out, uh, they are willing to disperse the money. Um, today, I do have Mindy Coleman, the in-house counsel for the Jockey Guild with us. And um, before, um, if the commission has questions for her before that, if um, Todd Grossman, our general counsel, has anything he would like to add, um, he's, he's looked at the um, statute as well. If, perhaps if we could hear from uh, Mr. Grossman first, that might be helpful. I, I see uh, Commissioner Cameron nodding her head. So Todd, if you could go. Um, forward, please. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, I think uh, Dr. Lightbound teed up the issue really nicely and pinpointed the area of the law that the Commission needs to focus on here, which is in Section 5H4 of Chapter 128A. As, as she mentioned, it identifies a number of areas that the racing monies once collected. Uh, including taxes and fees and all that, uh, those kind of items, how the money should be spent. Um, and the statute identifies uh, a, a large number of places the money should be spent. And one of them in uh, paragraph, subparagraph four, says that $65,000 annually should be uh, given to an organization determined by the commission that represent the majority of jockeys who are licensed by the commission and regularly ride in the Commonwealth. So uh, the Jockeys Guild is not identified specifically by statute. Historically, that has been the group that has been identified for receipt of these funds. But as Dr. Lightbound mentioned, now that there is uh, no active thoroughbred racing in the Commonwealth, uh, it was an issue that we believe needed to come before the commission to determine uh, whether the Jockeys Guild still met uh, the standard in the statute uh, prior to release of those funds. So that is the really narrow issue that's before you right now, uh, whether the guild um, is still uh, in uh, or still conforms with the requirements of the statute. The statute also provides that the benefits um, once paid out, the $65,000, are to be used for the purpose of providing health and other welfare benefits to active, disabled, or retired jockeys. So it's not limited to just active jockeys. Um, it is uh, open to active, disabled, or retired jockeys. Um, so the, the statute um, has a, a number of components uh, that you should consider in making this determination. If you are to uh, conclude that the, the guild still meets the statutory requirement, uh, the money would be released to them um, as the statute directs. If not, it would remain in the commission's account and be expended uh, otherwise consistently with section 5H. Um, so that's, that's the narrow issue that I believe is before you at the Questions or, or comments? Commissioner Cameron. <clears throat> yes, um, just comments. Um, uh, certainly I um, look at this and I've discussed this um, with the fact that it does talk about retired and disabled jockeys. And I am aware 
that there are a number of, in particular, disabled jockeys who are dependent on these funds. Um, I think that's an important factor as well. So um, I, I, when I look at this, I do look at it to include that, that um, statement about active, retired, and disabled. And uh, I know the monies are there, and there is great need for those monies. We can circle back to Commissioner Cameron, but Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner O'Brien. Commissioner Zuniga, Zuniga, you're leaning in? Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, just, just to agree uh, preliminarily, I mean, I, I'd love to hear from our guest uh, if she has some uh, prepared something, but um, I, I understand the, the technical read, but, um, but I think these, uh, you know, extenuating circumstances um, of, of, of the year that we've seen, you know, um, warrant the, the attention into the, the other areas like uh, the disability or retired. I don't think there was an, in, an implication that there had to be um, light raising for these monies to be uh, distributed. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, I guess a question for you, Todd, in the first instance, in terms of statutory interpretation, um, the language that talks about um, in 5H, the definition, if I can find it again, um, majority of jockeys who are licensed by the commission and regularly ride in the Commonwealth. Um, does in the Commonwealth have to modify regularly ride or can it just go back to the entirety of that phrase, the majority of jock jockeys who are licensed by the commission? So your question, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, is: Does in the do the jockeys have to have be riding in the Commonwealth? Right. Can, is the, can an interpretation be of the in the Commonwealth um, be modifying the entirety of that phrase? So does that represent the majority of jockeys who are licensed and regularly ride in the Commonwealth. Um, I uh, viewed it as two separate. Uh, components. Um, one that uh, the jockeys are licensed by the commission and then secondly that they regularly ride in the Commonwealth. That's how I read it. Um, not that they are licensed. I mean if they're licensed presumably by the commission then they would be riding in the Commonwealth. Um, so the two may go hand in hand. And then is there any sort of statutory instruction that would that goes to whether it's sort of a, an impossibility to satisfy anything? I mean, obviously, if there is no ability to regularly ride in the Commonwealth, is there a statutory construct to enforce the intent of the statute, which, as everyone has commented, goes to, you know, disabled and other jockeys, even though there may be an impossibility of satisfying another part of the statute? Well, I, I think that that's a, a, a good way to, to look at it. I, I haven't analyzed this for frustration of purpose or impossibility or anything like that, which um, is certainly um, on the table here, although I think those types of things typically apply to, to contracts as well. So um, in any event, I mean, I think it's in the ballpark here. Uh, when you read the statute holistically and provide, if, if you so choose to go in this direction, more of a kind of just reasonable read as to what was intended by the statute. Um, it doesn't, in my estimation, preclude that finding. Uh, but it is one that I could see going in either direction, which is why it was important that the commission weigh in uh, on, on this. But I don't see it completely frustrated uh, based upon <clears throat> So if I could weigh, weigh in on, on this, um, because I think I, um, my briefing with Dr. Lightbound, it helped shed light on this. <clears throat> Commissioner Cameron, these, this, these amounts have been helping uh, jockeys who have been retired or not riding because of a disability, an injury for a, a long time. That has been the practice. And in fact, you touched on the, that this is to benefit those who truly can't regularly ride anymore because of an injury. So I understand that Dr. Lightbound, you maintain, and correct me if I 
I've been misunderstood, um, that you maintain a list of jockeys who have regular who regularly ride or have regularly ridden in the Commonwealth. And from there, um, then you look to see if a majority of that list belongs to this particular belongs to a particular um, association and you've identified it as the guild still. I think that's mm -hmm. been pretty consistent. Is that fair that that's kind of been your practice? You maintain that list of of riders or those who have ridden and then you see if the guild is still the majority um, uh, association of the majority of them um, belong yes. to. Yes, and, that's true. So, and, and they and are, I, um, they're also the only jockeys organization. There is okay. no state um, organization of jockeys in Massachusetts. And um, I don't know of another um, national organization. I defer to Mindy Coleman, <laughs> but I don't know of another one. Yeah, and then I do want to hear from uh, Ms. Coleman. Uh, but <clears throat> so I I had to put in the context of what regularly rides means because otherwise we wouldn't be helping those who are disabled. Correct, Dr. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. I think you're thinking the same way right. I am. And, and, and right, it doesn't it doesn't it, to effectuate its purpose. It would be um, counterintuitive to restrict it. To the other interpretation to say you have to regularly ride to get the benefits it's, it's it's inconsistent if you read it that way that's right and so i mean i suppose this might be something for us to consider in the long term but right now this year we know there isn't any um uh, live racing in massachusetts there has been they've been able to sometimes ride outside of a commonwealth in the past and we can see if that happens again and then we have to figure out that interpretation. But um, I'm really comfortable with today thinking about the list that's in front of you right now, and I guess kind of worry about the future down the road, um, where things get more perhaps more complicated or perhaps simplified. Um, but because in the past that list included those jockeys who had retired or unfortunately could not ride again. So that's my thinking, but I do want to hear both again from Dr. Leibrand and of course now from Ms. Coleman. Um, uh, uh, if that's a good time, uh, Commissioner Cameron, did you want to add in before we turn over to our guest? Uh, no, the, I, the don't, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Okay. Just the only other comment I would put in too is, is um, you could have a circumstance where you do have live racing, but there may be more retired and disabled jockeys than actual licensed and regularly riding, um, which would just be another example of, you know, looking to interpret the purpose and intent of the statute. Down the road, yeah, yeah. We, in, in, right. If I may, um, we, we sort of had that in the prior years, certainly compared to the, the normal right. years where the statute was first operating, you know, when we had three days, et cetera, but, but you're correct. So Ms. Coleman, would you like to add your thoughts? And welcome, thank you for yes, coming please. today. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, uh, Dr. Leibound, thank you for having me. Again, my name is Mindy Coleman and I am the counsel for the Jockeys Guild. I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of background and some history and a little bit, hopefully to kind of maybe answer some questions and I know there's some, some um, hopefully I can give you a little bit of information and then we can figure out how we can move forward. Um, First of all, I want to tell you, the Jockey Field, we're a not-for-profit organization. We represent jockeys, as Dr. Lightbound was saying, throughout the country, um, both quarterbirds and thoroughbred, and we've been doing this since 1940. Uh, we have approximately 1,250 active, retired, and permanently disabled jockeys. Um, and our purpose is to protect the riders. We strive for safer racing environments to obtain um, improved insurance and other benefits to monitor developments in the local, state, and federal laws affecting the racing, and in particular, the jockeys. And then the benefits that we provide to our, our members include temporary disability, a life insurance, accidental death and dismemberment for active, retired, um, and then benefits for our permanently disabled, including reimbursements for their co-pays <clears throat> and durable medical goods. Now, this is separate from what you hear about with the Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund, if you are familiar with that. This is in addition 
to what they receive from the PDJF. Um, and then also reimbursements for the out-of-pocket health insurance for qualifying jockeys. This is kind of where the Massachusetts money falls into place is this reimbursement for out-of-pocket um, health insurance. Now, the current legend, what we have been discussing today, um, the Guild had been recognized for many years as the majority representative. And then there were some issues with the previous management and the Guild reorganized um, in 2008. At that time, we lost membership, we did some things, there was new management came in uh, under the um, reorganization, or under Terrence Meeks, who is our current president and CEO, as well as the board changed. Um, then we worked very hard with our members, rebuilding, regrowing our organization. At that time in 2012, um, we then petitioned to the commission, the Massachusetts Commission, to be re-recognized as the majority representative of the jockeys in Massachusetts. Uh, at that time, we then began receiving in 2013 the $65,000 annually to, um, for the guild to be expended for the health and welfare benefits for only jockeys in Massachusetts. That money did not was not used for jockeys or general funding. It was only for jockeys who qualified in, in Massachusetts. Through the input from the existing director of racing and representatives of the racetrack, the guild then established the criteria to determine who would be eligible to receive a pro rata share of the funds, including the jockeys, the jockeys who were regularly riding, the active riders, retired jockeys, and the jockeys who had become permanently disabled as a result of an on-track accident in Massachusetts. Um, that's, the eligible jockeys included both guild and non-guild members for active. The, the retired and permanently disabled, they were, um, it was required that they had to be guild members at the time of retirement and or their permanent disability. So when we have went through that and we've sent in um, annually when we've changed the, the that qualification, the, those qualifications stayed in place until there was a change in um, the reduced number of days of live racing in 2017. We then changed what was happening for what uh, qualifications were required for an active jockey and changed it instead of a set number or required number of mounts to a percentage of mounts that had to be required. At that time it was reduced to, or it was changed to jockeys had to ride 15% of the mounts of live racing conducted in Massachusetts for the calendar year. Um, we also reduced the number of mounts considered for a retired jockey to 3,000 mounts. And then there was uh, other parameters that had to be within the last 10 years because we wanted to make sure that we were getting the true Massachusetts jockeys the people that had stayed in Massachusetts and were riding there annually or regularly and making sure that we were providing for them. Um, so over the last few years, when, um, when we received those monies, it was the intention of the Guild that the monies be used to reimburse the riders for their medical expenses. The jockeys had to show that if they would, had showed that they incurred medical expenses for which the money was reimbursed, it would not be necessary for the Guild to issue a Form 1099. Upon the distribution, the jockeys are requested to submit any documentation for any out-of-pocket medical expense he or she has occurred in the calendar year uh, to be submitted no later than December 31st of the year of distribution. This includes any payments for healthcare premiums, any deductibles, medical expenses and or prescription expenses, dental expenses, and or temporary or long-term disability policy premiums. In 2020, based on the qualifications, and this was based on the monies received that were 2019's monies, we received that in 2020. There were 27 Massachusetts jockeys who received $2,407.41. This included 19 active jockeys, four retired jockeys, and four permanently disabled jockeys. In light of the fact that racing had ceased, that live racing had ceased in Massachusetts, we advised the jockeys at that time, based on our interpretation of the legislation, that that we would that would be final distribution of funds until live, re live racing resumed in Massachusetts. As far as uh, the definition, you know, 
because we were under the same impression as far as having it would be difficult to have licensed jockeys in Massachusetts because as to answer the question earlier you're not going to have somebody licensed in Massachusetts if there's not racing normally if they have an annual or a three-year license if that license expires if there's not racing they wouldn't have a license to to participate as a jockey they may be as a trainer or an owner but again it, it relies on racing occurring for them to have their jockey's license so we appreciate and welcome this opportunity if we can figure out a way to do this because there are you know two thousand four hundred and seven dollars or twenty five hundred dollars is a substantial amount especially to our active and retired i mean excuse me our retired and permanently disabled jockeys and the reason i say that is especially for our permanently disabled jockeys there is no guaranteed funding for our, our permanently disabled, including the PDJF and the monies that we distribute to the guild. They are limited in the amount of money they receive from the PDJF. And it is a minimal, nominal amount in order to provide for their costs. Um, so this is something that I know that the, specifically our four disabled and again, our four retired definitely rely on this money each year annually. So if there's anything we can do to facilitate or assist in, in being able to distribute this money to them, it would be greatly appreciated. I'd also like to point out um, the Guild does facilitate in, in distributing this money, but we do not um, we do not take any of the sixty five thousand for administrative costs in any way. It is we take with the sixty five thousand comes out and the sixty five thousand. We are the ones that do all the qualifications, the distributions. It does take some time again, mailing all the accounting, everything. And, and again, not that it, it, it's sort of what we do, but we definitely, there's costs that are incurred for it and we do not take anything out because it is something that we believe is important to be able to provide to, to the jockeys. I, I know I provided you some history. I don't know if I was able to answer all your questions, but I, I do hope if there's anything that I can, um, that, you know, there's 20 years of history. I just tried to give you in about four minutes. So if there's any questions that I can can provide, I would I'm here to answer anything. Commissioner Zinica. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that um, summary, Ms. Coleman. It's really helpful. Um, let me, if I if I may, uh, just drill down a little bit in, in roughly in some of the numbers you provided. You said 27 people. Um, 19 of them active at the time uh, of last year when the money was were distributed. Four retired and four permanently disabled. Um, what would happen uh, roughly um, to the 19 that were active last time, uh, this time around? What would happen to those monies? What is, what is your, um, your read of the situation and your process? That is something that we've been trying to, and that's what I had discussed with Dr. Lightbound. I am not sure how to, we would have to reevaluate the qualifications for the active. Um, what we had done leading up to this is we looked at in, in 2019, there was a total of 65 races. Based on the 15%, that meant that a jockey had to have ridden 9.75 or, or 10 races during the racing festival or during that time. Um, in order to qualify. Of those jockeys that, that were regularly riding in Massachusetts, you know, I, it's, I look and see the majority of those jockeys were regular Massachusetts riders that had been forced to move their tack or ride somewhere else. A lot of them were either had forced to been moved to Pennsylvania or uh, New York. Some of those have residents in Massachusetts. Their families are still in Massachusetts. They have just had to move their tack to other jurisdictions in order to continue to provide for their families. So if we could get, and again, I don't wanna go into a whole other uh, tangent, but if there's any way possible we get live racing back into Massachusetts, obviously those jockeys are gonna to return to Massachusetts. So I think that, you know, it's something I, I wanna be able to still provide for those active too in any way we can, because they are Massachusetts, you know, that may be something we have to look at too if we, 
provide it to the jockeys that are Massachusetts residents or if there's, I don't know if I answered your question correctly, but. I think, I think you're getting to the core of the issue um, here, which is this uh, uncertainty about the number of races in the future, the, the anomaly of this year, and the reality of those ties to, you know, these, these people that have had to, you know, race elsewhere to, to make ends meet. Um, my, perhaps uh, it should not be go, go, go without saying that, is it fair to say that um, perhaps there's still quite a bit of need for those uh, monies, however modest or a few in the number of people? I do think that there is a substantial, I mean, as I said, definitely for the retired and active. There will be, um, I will tell you, of a couple actives and, and potentially there are possibly two other jockeys that would then move into the retired category that I also know. Um, one individual has been a lifelong or has been a, a regular rider in Massachusetts for many, many years. He suffered an injury, didn't qualify last year on the active qualification per se, but he's going to be, would qualify under the retired this year. And he is somebody right now that I know due to his medical issues, he's not gonna qualify permanently disabled, but would qualify as a retired individual. And again, he's a Massachusetts, if I said the name and I don't want, like you guys would know, if you know racing, you would know this as a Massachusetts jockey. So um, I think that when we go back and look at the numbers, there may be one or two that'll be added under the retired that are, and again, in light of COVID, and riders, we were under the same circumstances as you know was alluded to with other people because of the restrictions. Even the people that were able to go ride in other jurisdictions, they took a substantial hit due to the COVID restrictions as well. Thank you, thank you for that. I, I wonder if um, a read of say, you know, be, being active rider in another state, but with Massachusetts roots. Would that be enough for us, you know, from a, to, to be able to say or direct to disperse those monies? <clears throat> Commissioner O'Brien? I'm not as comfortable with that interpretation so much as, um, you know, if they qualify under the membership rules set forth by the Guild, and then looking at the statute itself in terms of what is the reality on the ground in Massachusetts, and how do you effectuate the intent and purpose of the statute? which um, to have the disabled and retired jockeys wholly dependent upon the activity of the active jockeys could create um, an inequity and unfairness and could frustrate the purpose of the statute. So I'm looking at it kind of, it does sound like maybe you'd want to get more clarity depending if, if live racing doesn't return to the Commonwealth, whether there's some clarity that needs to come to this. But I think in the question before us, I'm comfortable looking at it in terms of that, in terms of looking at uh, the purpose and the intent of the statute and effectuating that under the current circumstances. Um, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Commissioner O'Brien, um, can you just, ex just expound a little bit how, um, I, I think I was clearer until I, I'm learning more from Ms. Coleman. How do we deal with the active jockeys under the construct? I guess I'm hearing that the guild attaches these criteria, and so the active um, must be licensed, and you can't be licensed in Massachusetts unless you are racing. Is that? I didn't have that understanding. Is that right? It does. I mean, that that is a that is a nuance that yes, until um, Ms. Coleman spoke, I wasn't aware of. Um, okay. It's not necessarily that you can't be licensed. Typically. And, and Dr. Lightbaum can allude to this, but if you don't have an operating racetrack and you're not, and jockeys are not in Massachusetts, when you come to the racetrack, you will get licensed in order to um, engage or in order to race. But the statute- and, and Dr. Lightbaum, are yours one year or three year licenses? Um, we do have three year licenses, but um, with suffix um, uncertainty as to when they were racing, um, none of the jockeys took out a, a three year. And basically, I think we had maybe one person out of the last three or four years that took out a three year license in general. So right now we don't have any um, jockeys that are licensed in Massachusetts. So Todd, is the stat does the statute 
speak to license or does it just say those who regularly rode or ride? It says so license. It, it says license, but you know, one read, yes. and the read, I think a fair read is that the language we've been talking about, the representing the majority of jockeys who are licensed by the commission and regularly oh, by the see. Commonwealth is included, I believe, to try to identify the organization the that the money should go to. It's not right. intended necessarily to be a prerequisite for everyone who receives the fund. Yeah. Um, and so right. in this case, given the circumstances, you are able to identify the organization that was really the intended recipient of these okay. monies, even though you could argue that given the circumstances, they may not uh, fall with neatly within the confines of the language. But um, I think you are able to identify properly the organization. So that's that's really an important distinction that it's about the organization. And then can you just remind me of the language because I don't have it in front of me. I'm sorry. Um, on the act of retired and disabled. How sure, it's that um, the $65,000 should go to uh, the organization for the purpose of providing health and other welfare benefits to active, disabled or retired jockeys. So I, I, I feel that that's that's helpful, but can I can I make a parenthesis here? Because I, I want to make sure I'm I'm understanding um, one situation. And it's a question for Ms. Coleman. Were we to disperse the monies because we all agree that 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 it's appropriate? Uh, what would the guild do relative to those active in the past? Would they hold off those monies because you also have some sort of interpretation here or what would happen to that to that money Excellent. so up until this year as i had explained up until the money that we received in 2020 was based on 2019's racing yes. we had racing in 2019 so we had qualifications for active retired and disabled those monies were distributed based on the active retired and, and permanently disabled qualifications when Dr. Leibound and Mr. Meeks and I spoke two weeks ago, we said that we would have to come up with qualifications for how would we distribute based on the active riders. If it was something that we would look at based on, again, location, previous qualification, qualification if they had qualified based on 2019's uh, racing and carry it over due to the COVID exception of 2020. And then obviously the retired and permanently disabled. And then if those two other individuals would then fall under the qualifications, we would add those to the list. So those are the, um, the other thing is, is it, again, the qualifications were not defined in the legislation and the guild was the one, and that was the thing. It, it, there was nothing, the money just said they would come to the guild and we could use it however we wanted. But in order to be fair, we thought that it needed to be for Massachusetts jockeys specifically. And then that's when we came up with these qualifications, again, based on the jockeys that we thought usually and regularly rode in Massachusetts. Thank you. I have a question. Commissioner, Commissioner Cameron? Oh. Yeah, Council Coleman, it sounds like you and the board are willing to take a second look in this. And as you, you framed it as a COVID exception, is that my hearing that accurately? Yes, we are. I mean, we were willing to do whatever recommendations and we, we want to work with the gaming commission here to make that determination. I mean, we're not going to just throw off the money, but it's definitely something we would take into consideration and we would present it to our board um, for their approval. Um, and my second question is, are there, for these active riders, are there similar um, similar monies from other states they may be riding in that they would have um, they would have the ability to apply for similar to our program or is this somewhat unique? So Massachusetts is somewhat unique. There are health benefits that are provided in New York, New Jersey, um, California, I'm missing one, and Delaware, and Pennsylvania as well. They are all set up differently and how the monies, where the monies come from, whether it's a taxation on, uh, California's for example is on cash tickets, New York is a taxation on the casinos and it's a substantial amount of money that comes in and they actually pay for a health, I mean they have a health insurance plan that the jockeys enroll in that health insurance plan. It is not set up 
this way. Um, what this is more similar to is in certain jurisdictions or certain, the Jockeys Guild has a um, industry partnership agreement with certain racetracks. And that is at uh, Naira, the Stronic Group tracks, the Churchill tracks. And in those tracks, we restrict part of the 50% of the monies that we receive under those agreements to the jockeys that ride at those racetracks. And it's under the qualifications or similar. So no, but yes, I guess is the okay. answer to it. They can, but it has to be, again, at qualifying racetracks. Right, and, and my last question is a process question. Um, we need to be comfortable, obviously, agreeing to the methodology here, um, making sure it's in compliance with, with our law, which we see it, I think it's pretty clear with retired and, and disabled. But would you, um, would it make sense, because you are looking for some kind of an approval from us, is that, I think I'm hearing that, um, would it make some sense for um, you to maybe in, in conjunction with uh, Dr. Lightbaum, take a look at uh, language that may you be comfortable with that you th and, and we can decide if we're comfortable with that may address the active piece. I'm just trying to, how do we move forward with a process uh, that we're each comfortable with that addresses the need? Absolutely. Over the years, this is that's exactly what we've done with the qualifications. We didn't have to do that, but we had sent it in to the commission. And again, um, as I said, it was with. Um, Jennifer Durenberger previously um, and then we had went through the racetracks also with Suffolk making sure and the horsemen showed these qualifications on how we did it we didn't do a formal commission approval it was not presented but I believe there was submitted and, and reviewed so yeah absolutely we can we'd be more than comfortable to show you what we have again for the retired and the permanently disabled. There may need to be some review of the retired qualifications too, um, just because there are gonna be certain people. Right now, it, it currently was, they had to have retired from racing on or after January 1st, 2008, because that was when the legislation, they must have ridden at least 3,000 career mounts in legal paramutual races conducted in the state of Massachusetts or 10 years as a li licensed Massachusetts jockey and must have ridden in the state of Massachusetts for five consecutive years before retirement. That last one may need to be tweaked again. Now it's gonna to have to be considered because we didn't have racing these last two years. Um, for the purpose of the section, any individual who meets the aforementioned qualification shall be considered retired from racing if they've ridden fewer than 50 races at any racetrack in the United States, licensed to conduct paramutual wagering. And this is similar to what we have in other jurisdictions. Okay. What are we thinking about process? Would we like to see something that would take all of these new factors into consideration and maybe come back at another meeting and address it? What are we thinking? Um, I what I'm thinking Commissioner Brown, is to, uh, to the discussion that you just had is when you look at the statute and it talks about the money going annually to an organization, comma, as determined by the commission, comma, that it represents you know, the active disabled or retired. Right now, I think we're all in agreement that disabled or retired would absolutely be represented by the guild. And then the question that you point out is, does there need to be a clarification in terms of active? And do we as a commission feel comfortable that it represents the majority with, with a connection to the Commonwealth such that the monies could also go out to the active? And so the as determined by the commission could include your, what you're talking about, which is board approval on further clarifying what the requirements are to address two things. One, the lack of live racing right now and then the COVID situation this year in terms of, to your point, there may be retirees who couldn't become retirees if you stick with this meeting because we've had the lack of racing. Um, for my comfort level and statutory interpretation, that would make me comfortable to then make a determination as a member of the commission that the guild represents that body of people such that 65,000 could go out consistent with both active and disabled and retired. If I may point out one of the issues, so if it's determined that the guild is the organization representing the majority of the jockeys, 
the monies it says to be distributed, it actually is an or. It says active, disabled, or retired or disabled jockeys. So it, not that I am trying to take away from active jockeys, but there also could be a determination because of the way we've done the 65,000. It has been pro rata share based on the number of jockeys who have qualified. So if it is determined that there is not an active eligibility, the other possibility is to do that pro rata share for the active and right, active and disabled qualifications at this point. I'm sorry, retired, excuse me. Disabled retired and, retired. and disabled until live racing resumes in the Commonwealth. Meaning until active riders return to the Commonwealth. If it is determined that the guild is represent, if, if it's determined that the guild uh, will be responsible for distributing the 65,000 or you're willing to allow that, the other option is do the pro rata share of the 65,000 to only the retired and disabled because it does say or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alex, help us out here on next steps, please. Um, I'll it down. <laughs> uh, it sounds like the um, commissioners might want to um, hear what I, I guess what the new um, qualifications would be for these different groups, and um, that can certainly, we, I can work with Mindy and um, we can come back to the commission with um, what whatever we come up with. And um, then at that time, the commission could look at that and see if it made sense to them. Um, we did bring back um, one of the times when they um, made a change to the requirements that did come up to the commission. I don't remember off the top of my head if it was um, voted on or if it was just presented in a commission meeting that, you know, due to the reduced number of days of racing at Suffolk, they were changing their um, qualifications. So it has been, you know, brought, the qualifications have been brought up before, so it's it's perfectly reasonable to do that again, if that's what the commission would like to, to see. Yeah, I, I'd be okay with that. There, there seems to be broad agreement relative to the um, retired and permanently disabled. Um, and I think, um, you know, maybe uh, speaking for myself, I, I think that uh, my, my read of our, of our obligation is mostly to disperse and identify the one organization that, that has done this both historically and pragmatically has, is the only one who has done it. Uh, I'm, I'm frankly, I'm, I'm comfortable either way, whether if this ends up going into a revised criteria that exclusively focuses on permanently and disabled and, and, um, and retired, or a criteria that includes active by some other measure because of prior ties or current ties to, you know, to Massachusetts. I think um, the way Ms. Coleman just broadly articulated what could be that criteria, I'm comfortable we could, we could get more details uh, and then and then go from there. But um, I think our obligation about the disbursement to the one organization is 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 straightforward. I guess I have one concern. Um, I, I I think we're all in agreement that we need to have some more information before we can vote because we can't disperse the money without knowing how it's going to be further dispersed. And and Commissioner Zunga asked that important question, and then. Um, so I think we do need further information. I am concerned about delay. Um, when would we normally, um, when would the, the um, particularly the disabled and retired jockeys expect to receive their disbursement? It, it has varied a little bit over the years. Um, if there hasn't been any changes to the requirements, the money usually goes ar out around this time to them, but there have been times when um, we were changing the um, requirements that the um, money didn't go out till like May. So, so I, I, I certainly would hope we could come back well before that. Yes, I would ask, given particularly the difficulties of the last year, that this is expedited, right? Commissioner Cameron, you're agreeing yep, with that? I, I absolutely agree. And Council Coleman, I, it would seem to me that you already have some ideas formulated as to what may be acceptable here, what might make sense. So um, I, 
are you, are you, I'm just asking you and Dr. Lightbomb could do this in a, in a way that wouldn't take a long, long time. Is that accurate? Absolutely. I, I think it's up to the commission if you're going to want me to consider active or not. I, I think that's up to the commission and, and that's would be based on how we would come up with those qualifications. So, and that would then determine the amount that would be distributed to each individual. Well, I, I would be interested personally in seeing language that includes active Okay. Um, language that would include maybe those new folks who are, <clears throat> excuse me, who are um, retiring. And I don't think there has to be any changes to those who are already retired and those who are disabled. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So I would be, and then at that time, when we look at that language, then we could decide, is it only disabled and retired or is it to, to include active? And Todd, you're, you feel comfortable with um, that we don't have to automatically exclude active. No, I don't think you do, but I think this is a good, a sound approach though. The one okay, I like uh, Commissioner Cameron's suggestion too. Commissioner O'Brien? No, I, I, I think that's the way to go because while in theory um, we don't have to, you know, exclude active, and I think given the circumstances that we should include them at this point, the further definition of what we are determining this agency represents, I think does beg the question of the role of active and the definition of active, which I think they can address right now. But, you know, years forward from now, that may change in terms of how this commission feels. Right. Um, it, I, I think it's, there's, it's, a, it's kind of an unusual, we're at an unusual juncture in terms of timing and, um, and expectations probably haven't been clear to the jockeys, so I think we have an obligation to clarify. Um, and, so and, uh, and, and sooner than later. Sorry, uh, Counselor. I apologize, there was a delay. I, um, one thing I guess I have a clarification on, so my, and this is where I think maybe we wanna make sure we're all clear, the definition of the active or the, where it's concerns about the active and the definition in the legislation, that is for you to determine if we are the organization that is eligible to receive the money, not for the qualifications of disbursement. So I think the commission has to determine if we are the organization first, before we can determine the qualify before the guild can determine the qualifications for disbursement. So, so back to Dr. Lightbound's list. Mm -hmm. You have a list, if I understand correctly, of all the jockeys who up until the closure of the Massachusetts track were regularly riding or had been regular riders and now they were either retired or disabled. Is, is that there, that list stands that you have that? Yeah, well, it was a list of all the jockeys that were licensed by us and if the guild um, represented the majority of those jockeys. So it didn't um, take into account um, what the state of the jockeys was. So, um, and yes, in, in 2019, the majority of the jockeys that raced at um, Suffolk Downs were um, represented by the Jockey Guild. And, and you don't have to maintain your license after you retire. This is only for active. Right, yeah. Okay. And obviously um, a permanently um, disabled jockey wouldn't have a license okay. either. Okay, so they don't have a license. Right. Okay. Matt Madam Chair, could we authorize now, make a motion to authorize the Jockeys Guild as the required, um, uh, as the authorized organization, but not take the second part of the motion, which would authorize the 65,000? I think it sounds like we're prepared to just make the first part of that motion, which is authorizing the Guild as the, um, as the organization. Commissioner O'Brien, questions? I'm not hearing a second, so. I, I'm a little hesitant with that just because I think some of what we are talking about does speak to that determination of representing the majority who are licensed and regularly ride. So I, I would rather do this all in one fell swoop with more clear definitions myself um, rather than bifurcate it. So it just sounded to me that uh, Council Coleman was looking for us to determine they in fact were the or organization before their work can be completed. Yeah, if, if, if I may, there seems to be a bit of a chicken and egg here uh, as if, you know, 
we, we understand that you need the determination, but we're asking you for a criteria uh, relative to the active uh, people. And, and, and I seem to be here, Ms. Coleman, tell me if I'm wrong, that, um, that you would not want to do that until you are the one designated organization. Is that a fair statement? No, sir. Uh, in response to Commissioner O'Brien, I think there was, what I was trying to get was clarification. As um, Dr. Lightbound had alluded, currently there are zero licensed jockeys in Massachusetts to date. There are okay. not any licensed jockeys in Massachusetts. She is referring right. to the 2019 list, which is what I was relying on as well. Yes, we would, mm -hmm. did represent the majority at that time. But because there are zero licensed, and this was um, responding to Commissioner O'Brien, in her question with regards to the definition of active, that is what, I cannot provide the definition of active. Even if we put the qualifications, it still won't uh, answer the question to the definition of the active as far as the legislation. And, and I would refer to your counsel Grossman as to, I, I, maybe that needs to be addressed as well. Separately sure. from the qualifications, yeah. I'm more than willing to come up with the qualifications and we have several variations that we're willing to do. So let's, let's think about this, uh, commissioners. What I'm hearing is that because of the shutdown of the track and perhaps because of other intervening factors, there are no Massachusetts active um, licensed jockeys right now. In this year, there was a list in 2019 of licensed jockeys. They do not include disabled or retired because they don't have to maintain a license. But yet, the statute definitely contemplated giving benefits to those who are disabled or retired. So, um, The six, the, we still have that $65,000 coming in. Seems to me, in terms of figuring out the organization, there's only one organization. <laughs> it's like there's a, um, I'm not hearing that there's even another national organization or one that we could turn to outside of the organization. And there aren't any licensed jockeys in Massachusetts to belong to an organization. So we have a threshold issue. Do we just decide not to you know, use those dollars because it doesn't fit into the, the licensed component as opposed to the regularly road or ride you know, provision and authorized distribution of the money to the guild? And then we'd want to know if the guild is going to distribute those dollars. Um, what I'm hearing is if they're identified as, the, regardless of maybe Councillor Coleman's interpretation, if they're identified as the qualified organization, she would work with us on the criteria for at least the, uh, the um, disabled and the um, retired jockeys. So it does look like we have a clear, now that I understand that they are licensed, which I don't think I understood coming into the meeting, we have a threshold challenge. I, I Councilor think that, Grossman, no, sorry, uh, Councilor Grossman, am, am I right? Is that that very, very narrow issue? And can then Councilor uh, Cameron. Yeah, I think that is the, an issue for sure. Um, They're and, not licensed. They're not yeah. licensed, but again, I, I don't think there's a statutory mandate that everyone who gets money be presently licensed. Uh, can, that's a right. prerequisite. No, I don't think we're saying that. We're talking just about the guild. Now, can I ask Alex on your list, they truly are, none of them are licensed. Do we have any that had the three-year license still? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Grasping here. <laughs> Sorry, we could get, achieve a majority with a few. Um, we appreciate Commissioner it. Cameron, yeah. yeah I, I, I think um, Councillor uh, Coleman's comments clarified things for me that their decision is really criteria. Our decision is active. And I, I'm finding it a stretch to, um, to consider 
those who aren't licensed and have, don't ride in Massachusetts as active, I, I clearly see the retired and the, and the um, disabled. Yeah, but even there's even one more threshold. I think you're you're right because on that criteria, I'm kind of okay with another meeting. I think the threshold problem for us is how do we choose the guild to receive the sixty five thousand dollars because we don't have any licensed jockeys to determine that they are the majority representative because they still represent the disabled and the retired. Yes. They're the same organization that presents, and it's an or, as as, as Councilor Coleman said. Well, but that's for the purposes oh, of that's not, not that's, as well. that, that's the trouble. It's the licensed language yeah. is on the identification of the guild. Right. As now, what the, you as do is troubling, right? There is a fair interpretation, and Todd, tell me if I'm off base in this interpretation that the money is to be distributed annually to the organization that we determine. Um, that represents the majority of jockeys who are licensed by the commissions and regularly ride is there doesn't seem to be a prohibition for us to take the snapshot of 2019 mm -hmm. and use that and say this continues to be the organization that represents the majority of people that were on that list. Now you may run into a problem when the retired and disabled pass on and maybe you don't have that majority anymore, but you could determine as a commission, we as a commission could determine they continue to be that organization and authorize the annual distribution to be effectuated consistent with the statute. Now, you, to your point, Ms. Coleman, you still, the active becomes, you know, the, the, the true bright line would be saying there are no active, only retirees and disabled can get monies at this point because it doesn't exist. Um, I would I think be you really could, comfortable with that snapshot of using right. Alex's list in 2019 for the licensed, so that it, it shows that the guild has been the player. Yes, the only and, turns out the only player, but the the one that represents their interests, right. and it's the vehicle to getting to the disabled. Right. And so, and I, we have no reason to change the determination that that they are the organization. Again, there are issues with distribution going forward in terms of. And, uh, and this, and and but, it would have to be a legislative change um, right, down the right. road or a new a new track or something because i think those folks who did race in massachusetts who became injured or retired you know had an expectation of, of getting coverage um i do, do do you see the threshold issue now uh, commissioner cameron it's just about that the i understand but i am very comfortable with commissioner o'brien's uh the snapshot yes absolutely Good. Yeah, I am too. What do you think, Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah, same here. Okay, so so then that takes care of uh, Commissioner Cameron's. Um, if we had that motion that was actually had never been seconded, but that's ident identifying the guild as the appropriate depository for the sixty-five thousand. I don't think we disperse that until we know the criteria, but I think we're hearing that. The active might be trickier than the other two. Are you comfortable with us asking them to come back with a um, in consultation with Dr. Lightbound, come back with the criteria and maybe make a, do we want to say two weeks? Do we want to say four weeks? Um, I, I am, and, and, and at that point we can decide if for all intents and purposes, the money would go to a small number of people, those that are only active and, um, I'm sorry, Permanently disabled and retired. However, you know, even if there's a, a, a new number of retired people, or whether it applies more broadly, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm comfortable with what you suggest, Commissioner Cameron. What do you think? Like bifurcated? So, I'm trying to understand this now. So we will make the motion um, as is. With the sixty-five thousand or no? What what do no, you suggest? I liked what you started with. Okay, um, so we'll start the motion. I see. So you were just waiting for that clarification on how to get to that first part of the motion. That's we'll hold right. off on the dollar amount because we're still unclear as to um, you know active versus retired versus disabled. And and I think that solves C Councillor Coleman's problem. Our are we in fact the right entity to receive it? And then she'll go forward on the criteria with Dr. Lightbound. Yeah, I think that's excellent. 
And I think we're, I think it's completely reasonable given all the circumstances for us to rely on that 2019 snapshot as the ent with respect to identifying the ident uh, the uh, entity um, that represents their interests. Madam Chair, I'm happy to make that motion. Excellent, thanks. And 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 we don't usually have a motion sort of hanging out there, but if you could reiterate this one it, was a little more complicated. Yes, thank you. Um, I move that the commission find that the Jockeys Guild meets the requirements in section 5H4 of chapter 128A as discussed here today. Second that. Any further questions to uh, Commissioner O'Brien? No. Okay, I'm all set too. So Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. I vote yes. Great. Um, in terms of, of uh, uh, Dr. Lightbound uh, kind of completing the next steps, uh, does four weeks seem reasonable? And if it could be resolved in the next two weeks, even better. Um, but for, I think could we at least ask for no later than four weeks, uh, Dr. Lightbound? Uh, yes. Um, Mindy, um, do you think, does that sound reasonable to you as well? Absolutely. Okay, great. Okay. Probably good. In the next two and weeks. I think we're pretty close on, like I said, the good. We'll and of course, we could things from the jockey we, club. And as an entity, we could be nimble too in, in between. So thank you. I, the, it's really important for the, um, you know, to to meet expectations if this is how it's going to, if we're able to distribute those dollars. And thank All you right. again. I was not trying to talk you out of. I just wanted clarification. I appreciate the opportunity, and we definitely want to work with you guys to be to be the organization. I just, I was confused and wanted to make sure I know that I couldn't provide you that quite the clarification that Commissioner O'Brien was asking. No, no, you weren't confused at all. Uh, you, you really helped us along. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Lightburn, are you all set then? I am. Thank you very much. Okay. So my um, computer has gone to sleep. Just one second. There. So um, I'm not sure where we are in terms of our, our timeline because I happen to have the other agenda up, but uh, are we comfortable now uh, going forward with, uh, we do have, I know, um, Director Ortiz on uh, waiting. So I'd like to go forward with the responsible gaming piece now. Are, are folks comfortable? Yes. Great. And I see Teresa joining us. So moving on then to um, <clears throat> Director Vanderlinden, please, and the responsible uh, gaming and problem gambling ones. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, so, uh, National Problem Gambling Awareness Month is just around the corner. It starts next Monday, March 1st. Um, and each year, the Gaming Commission, uh, in its own way, um, finds a way to honor this month. Um, honor its its meaning in different ways, and this month um, or next month is is going to be no exception. So um, I will ask Teresa, um, who is really spearheading this effort, to describe um, what the Gaming Commission is leading and the partnerships that we've developed along the way uh, to to recognize National Problem Gambling Awareness Month. Uh, following Teresa's um, presentation. Um, we have uh, Victor Ortiz, Director of Problem Gambling Services for the Department of Public Health. Um, Victor is going to talk to us uh, um, about the uh, DPH's um, work and specifically focusing on a transition and work they're doing to advance the uh, uh, Problem Gambling Helpline. Uh, so with that, Teresa, I'm going to just turn it right over to you. And then um, following that, uh, Victor, you can pick that up. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, good morning, commissioners. I prepared a memo this morning. Would you all like me to share my screen or would you prefer I just speak through it? I, would you like um, the memo or do you want a, the screen, commissioners? Either way is fine for me because I have it open, but... Um... It's up to you, to, to, to uh, I'd love to see uh, them as well. Sure. There we go. There we go. We love seeing each other, but it's helpful to have the memo. Thank you so much. 
that okay? Yeah. And and of course we've had the benefit of seeing it too. So thank you, Teresa. Great. You're very welcome. Um, and thank you, Director Vanderlinden, for the introduction um, to Problem Gambling Awareness Month. Um, I'd also like to add that this is actually an anniversary year for us. So 2021 marks the fifth year in which the Gaming Commission is recognizing and participating in Problem Gambling Awareness Month. Um, and as in previous years, um, the MDC will carry out most of our activities related to PGAM through the Game Sense program. Um, this is, you know, a natural sort of transition for us, given that um, Game Sense is the in Katina resource dedicated to ensuring that gambling remains fun and safe um, for all casino guests um, and staff members alike. So specific initiatives this year include weekly digitized educational quizzes and raffles, which are designed for casino staff and guests. Um, casino staff outreach via GameSense branded items and brochures. In casino digital signage. Overhead announcements at Plain Ridge Park Casino. A promotional event partnerships with MGM Springfield and Encore Boston Harbor. Um, GameSense digital advertising campaign, including retargeting and geofencing strategies. Um, so I'm going to advance down a bit. And you can see I included some examples of the ads which will be going out this month. So on the left um, is our standard ad. It's one of three message categories that we'll be putting out this month. Um, you would be able to find this um, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Google, or any website served up through Google or Bing search engines. Um, to the right are what we call retargeting and ads. So these will be served up to individuals after they visit and engage with the GameSense website. Um, they have a more specific and direct call to action. And so it sort of assumes that the user already has somewhat of an understanding of what the GameSense program is. Um, let's see, we have, um, we're hoping to launch an enhanced training on Asian and Pacific Islander community gambling risk factors and resources for Encore Boston Harbor staff. Um, the Mass Council on Gaming and Health um, has expertise in this space, so they're doing a lot of work in putting together those trainings. Um, launch of a live chat feature on GameSenseMA.com. This is something that we're really excited about, um, particularly since Encore Boston Harbor GameSense is back to being 24-7. This will allow people the opportunity to connect with the GameSense advisor at any time. Um, participation in the Cambridge Health Alliance Gambling Disorder Screening Day, which we have done for the past couple of years. Um, and I'm also happy to announce the March 2021 Problem Gambling Awareness Month proclamation, which was issued by Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and Secretary Galvin, um, which I included a copy at the end of this memo for you all to see. And I do have the hard copy of that as well. I will certainly be bringing that into the office to display um, once we are back in the office. <clears throat> And I would just like to thank um, Encore Boston Harbor, MGM Springfield, and Plain Ridge Park Casino for their contributions to Problem Gambling Awareness Month, which helps to underscore the importance of collaboration in mitigating gambling-related harms within the Commonwealth. And as always, um, a special thanks to the GameSense Advisors for their um, passion and enthusiasm in bringing these activities to the forefront. And so to close out the month, on March 31st, we plan to release preliminary results from five waves of the Massachusetts Gaming Impact Cohort Study, better known as MAGIC. Um, the study is led by a team of UMass Amherst School of Public Health and Health Science researchers. Um, MAGIC is the first major longitudinal cohort study of gambling behavior in the U.S. Um, it provides information on how problem gambling develops, progresses, and remits. Findings from the study can be used to inform the development of programs and services. And finally, um, increased attention and awareness of gambling-related harms during PGAM um, presents an ideal time to highlight um, an important initiative led by our partner at the Department of Public Health. Um, so Mark introduced Victor Ortiz, who's the Director of Problem Gambling Services. Um, and he'll present information about the new statewide um, problem gambling helpline. 
Now, before I pass it over to him, I also want to acknowledge Rachel Kane and Lorena Lama, um, who I believe are on this call. They have been excellent partners to us um, and really instrumental in launching this new helpline. So I thank both of them for their work. Um, so at this point, before I turn it over to Director Ortiz, I'm wondering if there are any questions or comments about some of the activities we have lined up for the month. Commissioners. Just, just a comment, Madam Chair. I mean, I, I, I love the, uh, I love the proclamation. I think, um, you know, kind of awareness and uh, from the highest levels of state government it really adds something to this. And the new um, connect at any time with a game sense advisor is a terrific feature as well. So really good work, keeping it fresh every year. Other comments for Teresa? Now, Teresa, thank you. Very um, holistic. And I know that you'll be working with our communications team to keep this um, very much in the news throughout the month of, of March. Uh, so thank you. Um, very exciting. If, if I could uh, just chime in, please. Um, Teresa has been great. And it is a challenge to keep to keep it fresh every every year. And whether it's Problem Gambling Awareness Month or Responsible Gaming Education Week, um, Teresa takes takes it seriously and, and rolls this out. So uh, thank you, Teresa, for your work on this. And I know, Teresa, you're thanking the licensees for their ongoing partnership, too. It, you know, Absolutely. Takes a village, right? Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or, or questions for Teresa? So, so um, I, I stopped sharing my screen. Um, so, Director Ortiz, if you want to hit the green share button at the bottom, um, you will be able to present your um, deck that way. And Victor, you're on on mute, just so you know. But first, I want to uh, thank uh, Director Ortiz for his patience. Today, we've run a little bit long, um, and uh, he's coming from a very busy agency. So, we appreciate your your patience and uh, and today's appearance. Thank you so much. Well, let me see if I can um, know how to work this technology and uh, share my screen. Uh, just give me one moment. Yeah, so we're seeing your screen. There we go. Perfect. There you go. I'm getting better at this. Um, uh, practice makes perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's nice to be back, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, grateful for the opportunity to present on this new um, new and evolving uh, um, uh, program on helpline services. And I believe I'm probably the person that's standing between you and lunch. So I'll try to be really brief <laughs> and succinct. Uh, one of the things that I want to just start with, um, you know, I, I'm now um, serving as the director of the Office of Problem Gambling Services at the Department of Public Health now. Uh, five years. I can't believe that it's been that long. Um, and I always like to start with um, our framing of who we are because I think it really sets the, the stage um, for what I'm about to share with you in regards to the helpline. At the Department of Public Health, it's, it's critical to us that our vision and our mission is grounded in the belief that everyone deserves um, the, 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 the right to optimal health and well-being. Um, but we understand that although we desire that, that not everyone's journey to reach the highest um, uh, level of health is the same for everyone. And so in order to achieve our mission and our vision, there are three pillars that you see in these blocks here that are critical to our work, that really informs our work. And we start with data. It is data that is like the compass and guides us to make decisions and how we think critically about how to disperse resources, how do we think about, um, you know, uh, critically think about responses to public health issues. The second block is the social determinants of health. And these are the conditions where people are born, where they live, where they grow, where they worship. And it's where we see the greatest levels of inequities that exist uh, for, for individuals. Research estimates that about 95% of individual uh, health outcomes is rooted in these social determinants of health. And so it's important for us to think critically about our approaches and that in, in those social determinants. And lastly, 
is the disparities. And I believe that we have a moral and ethical uh, obligation uh, to eradicate health disparities. It's this house, we refer to this framing as the DPH house. And I like to always say publicly that the Office of Problem Gambling Services is a room in this house. And it's, it's, this is the, really the, the foundation that we build our programs and services for problem gambling from this house. Um, in that same spirit, um, familiarized to us all, when we think about data, we understand critically that people with substance use disorders and mental health disorders are disproportionately impacted by gambling. We also understand that people of color are also disproportionately impacted by, um, by problem gambling. And also additionally, we understand that about over close to 97% of people who have a gambling disorder have a pre-existing mental health and substance use disorder. Uh, the evidence is clear and the data has been consistent on these facts. In Massachusetts, um, as far as background, we previously funded two separate helplines. One helpline for substance abuse and one for problem gambling. And after a series of looking at data, looking at evidence, we decided um, to explore this deeper. And so based on evidence, based on data, and also an evaluation that we conducted in 2019, where we added gambling questions to the substance abuse helpline and vice versa, added substance, uh, and added um, substance abuse questions to the problem gambling helpline, made some determinations uh, that really uh, set a new set of goals for us. And that is that we wanted to integrate these services in order to improve alignment, efficiency, caller's experience, and effectiveness. So it is in that same spirit with those goals in mind, after doing a rigorous sort of review of the evidence, the data, that we set forward on this, on this process to integrate the helplines. And again, the key here was to think about enhancing and optimizing the caller experience, maximize the cost effectiveness, and expand our reach. Two things that I wanna mention on, on these sort of goals. One, we determined that um, it was costing us for the problem gambling helpline about $400 per call previously on average, where the substance abuse helpline was costing us about $100 per call. Uh, so one thing can, can then make assume that with the integration, there will be significant cost savings that we can deploy to other areas and expand um, the services. In regards to expanding reach, you'll see here that one of the things that we wanted to make sure we were getting and receiving on the problem gambling helpline, somewhere around four, um, around somewhere about 500 calls per year, per, you know, uh, on average. Um, with that being said, the outcome of these integration and the advantages results in the following. One, currently as we speak, our, uh, the official helpline that we launched on July 1st that's being now managed by Human Resources in Action uh, is now providing a 24-7 bilingual service, fully bilingual in Spanish. Most times when we think about language services, it's a third party that sort of plays a role and you have to activate that. Here we have it fully bilingual in English to Spanish. Um, and are looking at ways to add Asian language and other languages as part of that, uh, as a way to depend less on the, um, on the service, on the language service uh, format. One of the critical things about that I'm really excited about is that we now will be able in Massachusetts as July 1st, we will be screening between 15 to 20,000 individuals who call the substance abuse helpline, we will be screening them for problem gambling. Hence our expanse, expanded reach. As we, we know that this is highly comorbid, uh, comorbid uh, issues and that provides phenomenal opportunity to tap into individuals that are struggling with substance abuse and to screen them for problem gambling. 
Additionally, one of the things that's another benefit here is that um, in Massachusetts, we have 22 outpatient treatment sites uh, who are referral ready, who are active and able to take referrals for individuals who are struggling with gambling disorders. And so the old practice would be if somebody would call, um, you would you know, give them the information, give them the number, you'll hang up with that person and that person would have to then call that place. And, you know, and so if we think about it from a call of experience, um, it takes a lot of courage for people to call a helpline to ask for help and probably at their greatest moment of stress. Um, in this new format, we will be able not only to receive that call, but transfer them directly to a treatment program instantaneously uh, without having them to sort of muster up the, the, uh, the call again. Uh, the other thing is that we, because of the, the dynamic of gambling as it is with substance abuse, we also will have not only helpline uh, specialists will answer the calls, but on every shift, there is a helpline clinician, a, a clinician who's a licensed clinician who would always be on shift in the case that there are some matters that need clinical intervention. One of the things that we know about gambling is that there's a high rate of suicidal su suicidal ideation. Um, and so having that extra component of a clinical specialist on, on site is critical to make sure that people get the help and the care that they deserve. And the last thing I want to share that um, is that we have a robust quality assurance. Every phone call that comes in, so when people call in, uh, you call the 1-800 number, uh, you can press one for substance abuse, two for gambling. And it would triage based on what you press to that specialist. Um, we record all the calls. All the calls are recorded. This uh, was never, not, not, this was not part of the practice in the past. And this is very really significant as an advancement for us because it allows us to be able to not only monitor the calls, but to utilize that for quality assurance to ensure that uh, folks are trained, folks are you know, triaging, screening, making the proper referrals, proper engagements, things of that nature. This, these points that I highlighted with you um, puts us in Massachusetts on a path to have the best problem gambling helpline in the country. No helpline no problem gambling helpline, uh, current practice, I should say, in, of helpline service in, in, in this country is that e either they're segregated independently or if they are part of other health issues, they're just a part of. It's just, it's just one, you know, one grouping. Um, but the fact that we are now moved into screening substance abuse callers for gambling really takes it to another level that doesn't, has, doesn't exist in this country. And I believe that to be the case because we've done an environmental scan. So this puts us on a path to have the most robust and uh, best uh, gambling helpline service in this country. Um, this was a significant um, heavy lift and we're proud of the outcome. Um, it really required a lot of uh, individuals to contribute to uh, the support of to get us to this point. Um, we are actively engaged in a robust transitional plan that started with uh, both working with the with with the Mass Gaming Commission, but also with the lottery, uh, and transitioning the numbers that exist on a variety of different points of contacts, whether they're websites, lottery tickets, and kiosks making those transitions. And so we want to say that we're like 80% there. <laughs> there is still quite a bit to go in some areas because of printed materials. Uh, but I, we have been working very diligently with uh, Teresa, who's been phenomenal. And thank you, Teresa, for all your support in that, in that space, because you've been, uh, I know, working with Rachel and Lorena, and, and you guys have been doing a phenomenal job addressing that and making that happen, as well as our contacts and, and partners at the lottery. 
The other piece that I also want to extend that thanks to Teresa is that one of the things that we notice, and these are some of the things where, where I've said the magic happens, right? And, and one of the things that was brought to my attention is that we want to make sure that our helpline specialists understand, know, and are familiar with um, the resources that are provided through the responsible gambling efforts. Um, and so Teresa led an effort to ensure that Game Sense advisors, and there was a training with our helpline specialists uh, to ensure that they are aware of those resources, including things like voluntary self-exclusion and things of that nature. Um, and we're committed to those trainings being ongoing uh, because it takes more than just one training for people to get it. And we'll be monitoring that through our uh, quality assurance. So if someone is not picking it up, whether it's like they're missing it on regards to voluntary self-exclusion or they're not making the right referrals, is that an individual issue with professional development or do we need to have a refresher or whatever the case, uh, that is something that we're obviously committed to. Uh, the other two phases um, provided that we um, uh, have a, a, um, a website that's dedicated to the to the helpline. Uh, we developed a new logo, as you can see here on the slide. Uh, a data dashboard is also something that we're developing as well that gives us, you know, uh, data on the demographics and uh, information that we're collecting. And lastly, on our third phase is about promotion. Uh, and Teresa covered some of this, and that is that as part of Palm Gambling Awareness Month in partnership with the Mass Gaming Commission and the lottery would be our central activity, our, our key activities to promote the new helpline. Um, we're excited about this. As I mentioned, as I mentioned, um, as I mentioned, this puts us on a path uh, to have the most robust and best helpline in this country. And we know that it is not just one person or two individuals or one entity, it takes us all collectively. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to present and share that with you this afternoon. Uh, and I'm also grateful for all the work that has led to this point. So thank you. Thank you, um, Victor. And there you are, Teresa. If we take down the um, screen, we can, it's easier to predict. There, now we've had, we've heard both presentations. Commissioners, comments, questions. Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, um, Director Ortiz, very nice to see you. Thanks for coming in to present to us. This does sound exciting. Um, what I see, and I think is a really good point, is whether it be the website or the hotline, both have the name problem gaming. So the user experience is seamless with this new transition. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Excellent. So folks are used to calling maybe they won't have a different name that they're not accustomed to. They'll they'll get to the to the right folks um, by that they're very accustomed to using the problem gaming um, hotline, correct? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. If I may, thank you, Victor, for the presentation. Um, if I may, um, now that there's one, there will be one, uh, one line, uh, um, one, one agency, I guess, that uh, that gets all these uh, calls. Just from a user perspective, can you um, can you help us understand um, how does anybody get routed? Let's say. To the, to the appropriate help and how, uh, specifically also, how are people screened? You see it's like a recording that says press one if your problem is, if you wanna talk about problem gambling or press two if you wanna talk about substance abuse. Um, how, how is that first user experience now that there's yeah. different, um, different uh, many, many more people calling for many more reasons? Yeah, so the way that it the way that it operates is that um, the folks that are the helpline specialists are the same group of individuals. They're taking both gambling calls and they're taking both substance abuse calls. They're the same group of individuals. They're, they're cross-trained for both subjects. It's just that when it comes in, there's an alert that the call is for gambling so that the person who is receiving the call knows, ah, I have somebody for gambling who's coming in for the call. Um, on, the, on the beginning stages, if you're the caller, um, it just allows you, it, it eliminates this awkwardness where if you just call directly in, 
where the person doesn't know what your primary issue is. Like that, that would not be optimal. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, so the person will say press one for, for gambling and then the person will be alerted on the other side and then they start the process. So, oh, okay, so it's a user, uh, it's not that the number alerts the recipient of the call to know that it's for gambling. It's the user that says, I want to, I want help on gambling, let's say, and presses two or, or three or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I mean, there's the same number for the gap for the helpline for gambling is the same number for substance abuse. Okay. Um, it's it's the same right. number. It's just that the activation for that individual is different. Okay. Now, on the other side, on people that, and this goes to the comorbidity, on, on people that don't press gambling, perhaps, they're, they're thinking about, they're anxious or whatever the case may be, um, you know, and they have other, other issues. Mm -hmm. How is that screen done? I know it's the, the three question screen, but um, how is that, uh, when is that introduced or how is that um, administered? You know, now that you have somebody presumably not calling about gambling, but being screened for it. So there are, there are two different ways that that happens. One, we do have the screen. But I think beyond that, it's important for people to be trained about gambling because, you know, um, and just in my clinical <laughs> experience, if you ask, if my primary reason for calling is substance abuse and you ask me, hey, do you gamble? I'm like, I don't, I mean, I, I, I'm calling you about substance abuse. Why are you asking me about gambling, right? Um, and so, but we, we are, we have created a really robust training on gambling for helpline specialists as part of their professional development that allows to build their capacity specific to gambling. So for example, so when you're in conversations, you can pick something up and say, wait a minute, <laughs> you, were at the, you were at the casino and you were drinking. And so if, if you have a drinking problem and you were at the casino and it's so it has a way of teasing out some of that element. And, and the hope is to, to optimize it that that we're not segregated these services, that these are one individuals and a lot of these issues run together. So yep. that in the case that you didn't screen, you didn't screen positive for gambling, but we see it, we might say, you know, if you're at the casino, you might want to think about, you know, these things, you know, um, game sense advice, you know, whatever that those resources could be to support that person uh, or even talk more about that person about their gambling. Um, you touched on the, my last question, uh, and that was the, the, the referral and the, and the, you know, and the warm handoff, which is, from, from what I understand, a really sort of promising and, and, and an optimal uh, uh, down the road, uh, um, you know, from somebody getting a helpline. Um, how, what, what else can you expound a little bit on, on those uh, referrals, specifically to the voluntary self-exclusion program that we know um, is is tremendously helpful in the casino in the yeah for when it comes to problem gambling in casino venue. Yeah, I, I would say that you know Mark and I are, are working towards um, finding out a path to make that happen, not just in that experience, but this is part of an ecosystem of service. So if you think about it, you know the helpline is just one piece, and we have our outpatient services. I believe the voluntary self-exclusion is an important is an important uh, tool in the toolbox, and so uh, I think the one handoff opportunity is there. We're working through those logistics, like how do you how do we make that happen? And then I I'm also I think as as of, I think it was last week, Mark and I were just having some preliminary conversations, which we'll be having for quite quite some time about how to include that within the treatment aspect as well. Ultimately, what we want to do is what's best for people. Um, it's not helpful, at least in my opinion, in 30 years of clinical practice, of segregating services for people. So in other words, if, if you're, you know, you're one person and, and you have to refer people to five different places, <laughs> it's, just not, it's just not optimal. Um, you know, if people are struggling. Um, if we can be able and sort of one-stop shop meet their needs, whether it's voluntary self-exclusion versus, you know, a referral or whatever, uh, this is why we have a clinical person on site who also is trained around gambling and some of these services. So I, I would just say to, that there's still a lot of, a lot of runway here, <laughs> but I think the building blocks are there for us to, to enhance what we already have by bringing in um, some of these other additional resources like voluntary self-exclusion. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's really helpful.
Other questions or comments? Commissioner O'Brien, are you all set or do you? No, I'm, I'm all set. Just thank you to Chesa and um, Director Ortiz for their time and for laying that out for us today. I'm really pleased with um, uh, the, the, despite all the challenges of, of a pandemic, which has really um, been, this has really taken over the Department of Public Health and, and commands its attention appropriately and in so many of its resources that the level of collaboration between our agency and yours, I'm so pleased with it. Um, and you've been able to you know, tend to this uh, transition, which it took place, this, this project took place um, pursuant to a competitive procurement. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, and, you know, you've, you've accessed important resources from us, Victor, uh, using um, Teresa's expertise on training and, and uh, our, our division's expertise. So we appreciate it very much. And I know the licensees are all working hard to implement this. So again, complete collaboration among um, a lot of important players. So thank you. Well, we thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for your support. Um, and we appreciate that. I think um, there's, um, we think there's, this is just the beginning stages of what we have in front of us in regards to collaboration. And I know that I speak on behalf of the department that we're also grateful to your leadership and support and, and the Gaming Commission and working together to, to really accomplish what the legislation asked us to do, which is to mitigate harm. And that's what we are responsible for doing. And I'm glad that we are all working together to make that happen. Excellent, thank you. Commissioners, are you all set? We can let um, Victor go for his lunch. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, stay well, stay well. Um, now I know that we're a little bit off our schedule, uh, got a lot of important work accomplished, but we do have, um, we had planned on the evaluation in advance of lunch. I must say, I think I could probably use a break. Um, and Commissioner O'Brien, you're, you're nodding your head. Okay, everybody agrees. So um, it's, it's one o'clock. Uh, should we, is a half an hour sufficient or do you need more time? Half an hour, Commissioner? That work for you, Commissioner O'Brien, with school-aged kids? Okay, excellent. So, uh, um, Karen, I don't know if I see Karen right now. Um, I presume, oh, yeah. is that good for you? Uh, does that work for you? Uh, That's let's come back in half an hour? Yep. Okay, then uh, to the team members, we will, um, we will take a break. Uh, Tanya, thank you for your ongoing support and work. Commissioner, uh, Councilor Grossman, thank you. And we'll reconvene at 1.30. Thanks everyone. Okay, I see all, all four of us. So we'll take a roll call. Again, we're reconvening um, meeting 337, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission and roll call, Commissioner Kim. Uh, good afternoon, I'm here. Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. And Commissioner Zunica. Here. So all four are present. Uh, we can get started. Tanya, you're all set. And I presume Austin's all set. So we'll get started. And we are, um, after a busy morning, um, again, with a full array of subject matters, we are now turning to one of our um, responsibilities to um, <clears throat> perform a, an annual evaluation of our executive director. So, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, if you'd like to lead the discussion, please. Certainly. Um, I know Karen has been, you know, waiting with bated breath for this <laughs> morning. After lunch is nice and relaxing for you. Right. Uh, um, I would be shocked if, I, if you're not going to hear the same thing from a lot of the commissioners. Obviously, we have not spoken to each other about your evaluation. I the individual ones were provided to you. Um, to summarize, like I'll start off, unless you know, someone else wants to go first, so I'm happy to start off with my overall feedback to you, Karen. Um, um, 
I, I, I say this to, to people who ask that, you know, I've known you for a really long time. I, I'm not at all surprised that you've exceeded, met and exceeded or exceeded the expectations that I would have had when we selected you to take over, uh, not both as acting and then the last part of the year as the permanent executive director. I think you came in with a tremendous amount of experience um, professionally and then also, you know, internally within this agency. You had a tremendous amount of support and respect and trust from the staff which I think helped you tremendously. Um, but you also stepped in at a, at a very critical time. I mean, you, you stepped in and within months were faced with, you know, an unprecedented pandemic and shutdown and transition to remote. Um, and the staff was invaluable in helping with that, but you were, you know, sort of at the head of the helm for staff. And I think your ability to transition this agency at that time uh, very much sums up what you have, what you've done in terms of your leadership and stepping in, um, whether it was, you know, acting or shifting into the, the role on a permanent basis. Um, I know that I personally had conversations with you very shortly after you were put on as acting with certain things that um, it came to your attention weren't resolved. And it was really not something that for sort of morale of the agency should have left, left unattended. And I was very pleased to see you ask um, you know, smaller groups of staff and, and one or more commissioners to help and, and address those things. I know some things have had to wait, given the pandemic, but you've been pretty good about calendaring things and circling back. Uh, and you know, we can speak to the end about your priorities, but I know you give a nod to one of those factors um, in terms of salary, um, equities and that sort of thing at the end of your evaluation. Um, I would say that one of the things that has been consistently said to me about you, and again, doesn't surprise me, was um, unsolicited how staff would come and give positive feedback and support for you, both as IEB director and, you know, when you were in the running and now that you've been in the position of executive director and that you are uh, respectful across the board, both internally and externally, and that you, um, you identify yourself as a good listener, and I would agree with that that I think that one of the things that has enabled you to be successful is your willingness to um, listen to everyone and then use your judgment and they go forward from there because the reality is you're not gonna listen to everyone and there are times when um, the listening is over and then the decision making has to happen and we have to go forward. Um, I definitely think um, in terms of an area of improvement would be, um, delegating to make sure that you have the time to do what you need as executive director, keeping all of now four and you know soon to be hopefully five of us up to speed on what's going on and apprised of what's going on. Um, you're making the transition away from director of IEB and I trust that that will be easier for you to do as the year goes on because these upper level vacancies have now been filled, which I think you know, maybe impeded the ability to do that earlier on. But I think you've got good people in place, having moved some internal candidates around and promoted from within and brought some really good external hires in. Um, but I, I just want to say, again, not surprised, but I think you've done an excellent job this year. Um, I think the areas of improvement are, you know, typical for anybody who would need areas of improvement. And I think, again, I, I trust and hope that what we give you in support and what the new leadership team you have with you gives you in support will enable you to continue to be successful. Great. Thank you. There, there we go. go. There we go. Yeah. Just, I just want to point out that there's about 275 people gathered today <laughs> at this public <laughs> meeting. I'm joking. I'm joking. It's, yeah. um, um, no, the number is well, well short of that. I just want, wanted to uh, point out that you've got through one fourth of your evaluation. Um, and uh, now, Karen, I want to give you the opportunity, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, I'm sure you'd like this too, if you'd like to respond to Commissioner O'Brien now, or if you want to wait, uh, but you will have the opportunity to, um, of course, uh, indicate, you know, explain to us and your team your goals, et cetera. But um, if you want to respond to um, Eileen right now, or do you want to hold? Why don't I wait till the end? Of okay. All of Does that make sense, Commissioner O'Brien? Yeah, whatever her preference is, is fine. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna let continue to let you lead then, Commissioner O'Brien, thank you. I think uh, Commissioner Cameron was queued up, ready to go. So I will defer to Commissioner Cameron. Queued up and ready to go, I like it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. 
thank you, Executive Director uh, Wells, for the opportunity. Actually, this was a pleasure to uh, read your self-assessment and then uh, comment and give an assessment uh, you know, with that. Sometimes they're not a pleasure to do. This one certainly was. Um, like Commissioner O'Brien, I've known you for many years now. You've worked with this commission. Um, you were one of the very early folks um, in the position for, as the um, as the director of IEB. And um, one of the things I've learned over the years is past performance is usually a very good indicator, predictor of, of future performance. And in this case, I can say that certainly holds true. You did an excellent job, uh, in my opinion, as the IEB director. And this year, in this just very challenging year, um, I think you performed well under stress, under fire, and uh, we are all the, the uh, beneficiaries of that. In particular, though, I'm always concerned about the staff. And uh, like Commissioner O'Brien, unsolicited, we, we had the benefit um, of the, over the last several months of meeting with all of the directors and their key staff members to talk about what their challenges are, um, what their progress is, projects they may be working on. And I have to say, unsolicited, um, each and every director, team member talked about your leadership and how that helped them through their challenges in this year of a pandemic. I think it's really apparent to, to team members, as it is to me, um, that you're a caring, compassionate leader. And that is in particularly important in a, in, a, in a year like this. I think that really makes a difference. People, you know, it's, it's Maslow, right? Basic needs have to, be, have to be fulfilled. And I think with so much uncertainty, so much um, fear, and just trying to get the job done under very trying circumstances, they, the team knew they had a leader that, uh, that could help them through and really cared about them as individuals, cared about their their um, professional development as well. So I, that, that was on display this year. I think your internal and external communications are very strong. I know I have felt um, in a challenging time, right? I just can't walk down to your office like I used to to find out something I may need to know. But in a very um, challenging time, I felt like I had uh, the ability because you would pick up the phone and call and say, hey, just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, or I can pick up the phone and you're always available, by the way. I, I made the big mistake of calling you yesterday on your birthday to talk <laughs> about this evaluation, not knowing you had taken the day off. But of course, you were gracious and took a few minutes with me, and, um, which, which we've all come to expect, frankly, is your, um, your, your ability to, to be there and, and be patient and uh, answer all the questions that all of us may have. I think it is a challenging position, right? You have the whole staff and then you have uh, five commissioners to deal with. So um, I, I think those are all really strong points. I was not surprised. Sometimes I read a self-evaluation and I'm somewhat surprised because it's not how I see that person necessarily. Uh, in your case, I was not surprised. Um, you're very self-aware, on point, um, you know, goals are, are right on point, um, how you can develop professionally, um, it, you know, you, you spell it out pretty well, actually. And um, so I just, I just want to commend you for that as well. I mean, I'm not going to go through every category, but you're, you're really strong, Karen, in so many areas and, um, and wanting to get better, which is what I see too, and not afraid to say, hey, um, you know, and, and some leaders, this doesn't happen. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure how, to, how I'd handle this. What do you think? Um, so I just, I just uh, appreciate that. And um, I think we're all lucky to have you as, as, a, uh, as a leader in this position. And uh, overall, just a, just a really, really strong year. Um, and I know it'll only get better. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you. I'll be happy to follow suit if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's clearly a consensus, uh, a, a theme, if you will, emerging very quickly, which I'm not surprised of either. As, as my 
by our colleagues were alluding to. Um, let me let me start with the bottom line, and I think uh, you know simply you've done a fantastic job. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the context uh, that's that's clearly in front of us, and that is this last year that, by many measures, has been one of the most challenging of the Gaming Commission, and that's that's probably true for um, many of us in in prior roles. Uh, just given all the uncertainty of the pandemic. Uh, uh, and, but but then but the reality of having to continue with a, n a number of things that we that we do normally. Um, to be more specific, uh, uh, you know, this last year, as we look back, uh, uh, a pandemic that forced a quick transition to working remotely, but but went smoothly. Um, an environment of casino closures and reopening with significant restrictions, uh, which meant a lot of. Um, uh, flexibility needed, a lot of logistical challenges in terms of operations. Um, and, and I should mention this as well, the reality of having to do, to be more judicious, more judicious than before perhaps, relative to regulatory costs and manage resources, uh, perhaps as lean, as efficiently as possible, because there was this reality of the casinos being closed and we decreased revenues that clearly seep through what we do. So in other words, adjust quickly to a new, new environment with admittedly less resources, but keep doing what has always been expected of you and the organization. And that's probably the, 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 the most important context to take stock of in this year and, and, and you know, and, and think about how difficult it, it has been. Uh, it's, it's been getting better. Um, but it's an important context as we do, as we do this evaluation and, and, and it's unlike any other ones that we've done uh, before. Um, if you'll indulge me, my comparison to the other um, evaluations, it's I'm reminded of the, of the story they tell about Fred Astaire, who was heralded as you know, the best tap dancer of the time, but people would then point out, wait a second, uh, there's Ginger Rogers who's doing it backwards and in heels. Um, and, and that's an important, perhaps appropriate little distinction here. Um, so um, let me just stay, be more specific about uh, some, some key aspects uh, that, that I see are very positive. Um, you, you, you really take ownership and decisive action when it comes to managing both the staff and the affairs of the commission. And what I've observed, um, is that you really have a balanced approach in interacting those uh, with, with staff and designating the key areas. You really own the follow-up, uh, what I've seen in, in not just public meetings, but other meetings, uh, but you delegate them appropriately and that's key in, the, in, in, in your success. Um, that's any successful executive director uh, needs to be able to do that well and, and that's, that's a really key feature. Um, I would also describe your uh, approach to management as being creative. Uh, you look to turn challenges into opportunities. I'm specifically thinking of a couple of vacancies we've had in the organization and the redefinition of a couple of roles, and that's key, um, especially in times like this. Um, too many managers and ourselves in the past have also thought about like, you know, we need a big overhaul or a reorganization. Uh, but then miss in, in, you know, the opportunities that come organically and periodically, and 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 this is true for you, uh, not not the big re planning. You haven't missed those opportunities, and I think that's a that's a big benefit to the organization. And I encourage you to do to continue to do that. And to top it all off, uh, we've undertaken we've undertaken uh, new initiatives during this year. Um, I'm thinking of the equity and inclusion uh, working group, uh, as well as the regulatory review, um, of which you are you have been a key member. I know those things uh, firsthand because I'm also a member. But I've observed important and ongoing progress in, in these initiatives. And I think that's also worth mentioning in, in, in terms of all these uh, context. Um, obviously, we might uh, have to continue to navigate um, uh, things that change. Uh, perhaps there will be a, a, a sports betting expansion. Um, 
we have to react uh, accordingly if that if that comes to us. But the point is that um, you you speak perhaps a little bit in, in in keeping in your evaluation in keeping the boat afloat. I think it's being afloat and navigating in the in the the way and direction that needs to go, and that's that's important also thing to under underscore. Um, you're also very effective personally at being highly responsive. And I think that's a huge asset for you and a big benefit to the, to the organization. Uh, but I must say that a big strength, like many things in life, have a bit of a flip side or potentially a flip side. Um, being highly responsive on occasions may result in things taking a sense of urgency that later on in retrospect it may not be warranted um, and um, while this is, may not be a big deal for any one given instance um, you know it is at least conceivable to me that eventually there's a cumulative cost to work-life balance i've got to think of the executive director job as a bit of a raising a child uh, that it, it might push you if you let it uh, and that's that's important to understand if you know in in this role not only for you personally but that's also important because of what you signal to uh, other staff by virtue of what you do how the choices uh, we make um, that's true for us by the way commissioners as well um, we all contribute to the organization and and it's something just to pay attention to I'm not saying uh, I want to go back to my fundamental notion of this that this is a huge asset but uh, again like many assets uh, there's, there's there's a flip side uh, to that coin I, I, and i think we need to just be mindful of that um i can stop there and uh i, I plan to talk a little bit about goals for next year but if we're going to do that uh, collectively at a later time in, in this presentation um commissioner brian did you have any idea on that or yeah, I, what I thought we would do is just um, summarize once everyone's had the opportunity to sort of give an, a, a, a retrospective, go through and sort of summarize next year. And then if we have any thought on tweaking or discussing those goals, then we can do that at the end. Okay. So I'll pause there and um, come back to you. Excellent. Uh, yeah? May I go ahead, Commissioner? Sure. Thanks. So, um, Karen, I'm looking at the number of participants. Oh, oh my God. It's, a, it's hovering around 50. That's helpful. <laughs> um, not many people get evaluated in front of a crowd. And, and for this, um, I, um, you, knew, you knew this coming in to the job. Uh, you had to really um, apply for the job in public. And, and you did that with grace. And you have continued to perform all of your duties with that same grace. And today, showing again, the grace that comes with having your your um, assessment be public. So thank you. Uh, you know, I um, like Commissioner Cameron pointed out. It was a pleasure to do this assessment and to reflect upon your your last year, uh, your your role um, of uh, leadership really extends beyond a year for us. But we are just evaluating this past year, which of course was marked mainly by. Um, the crisis of the pandemic but my overall assessment is that you know not departing from anyone else's is that you've exceeded expectations and that in two places i find you have been exceptional um, and that would be of course again with respect to how you were able to pivot um, and uh, keep the team together so that they could continue their responsibilities um, as of you know, Mar March, uh, I guess it would be 16th, when we went from remote on the 14th, that was a Saturday. On Monday, everybody felt that they still had that, uh, an ability to do their job. And you and I both know that it was critically important, not only for the good of the commission, which we know has to be a priority, but for the good of each of your team members, that sense of purpose. And you've been able to um, really provide that sense of purpose for the whole year and you but you've done it with the, the right degree of care um, making sure everyone knows but it's okay to pause but at the same time you've been able to really have the commission 
um, so day to day operations continue in a most remarkable way. And then you have the overlay of, of all of the responsibilities that came with the pandemic and, and really working with our licensees to make sure that they were able to close um, in a responsible fashion and then reopen it in a sustainable way. So on that point, I found that to be exceptional. And I really hope that you never have that obligation again. Um, fingers crossed. The second, the second would be, um, you know, during the course of the year, we were, we were faced with an, a lot of difficult national conversations. And um, it became clear from my perspective that with respect to racial inequities, that that had to be a priority for the organization. And, um, you know, you were part of the working group that Commissioner Zunica alluded to. We were very lucky that that group um, worked very cohesively so that the results could come out in really timely fashion for the entire commission's um, review and consideration of the five action point plan. And we put you in charge of that. And I feel that you have been exceptional in understanding the import of that work, that you embrace the commission's um, really ratification of the importance of making um, inclusion and diversity and, and making sure that we don't inadvertently uh, impact uh, in a negative fashion people of color. You, you immediately embraced it and you put it to work. And you've used your team members to do that work. Yeah. And you've, um, I, I feel that across the board in many quiet places, I'm seeing that um, awareness at work. I note that the gaming agents have a new, a new newsletter and how wonderful it was to see that it started with a discussion around Black History Month. Uh, so that doesn't come by just chance. That's a culture shift and a culture awareness. And for that, I think you've been exceptional. And I know that that's an, a priority for the commissioners, but I know it's a priority for you going forward. And we all know um, it's ongoing work. So uh, those two areas I felt were particularly noteworthy, and I know Commissioner Zuniga also referenced that good work. In terms of your interpersonal skills, including communication, you're just, you have exceeded expectations. Um, I note that I, I value your listening skills immensely. I also note that there are times when I would like you to sometimes intervene or add in just a tad sooner because your observations and your awareness and your resolution skills are so helpful. So if you ever find us looking around going, oh, yikes, <laughs> um, you know, please uh, uh, um, add in. And, I, and, and that's not in any way compete with your respect, the respectfulness that you offer everyone. So um, uh, in terms of, you know, I think you suggested somehow your writing skills, your, we, I value your writing skills, your um, public speaking skills. They're all outstanding, very accessible, and we are very lucky that you are so comfortable as a communicator. In terms of your interpersonal skills, your, your team says it to us. We all say it. Um, you know, I, I know that those will just continue to expand and, 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 and uh, will serve the commission well. What I love best is that you recognize that the greatest asset in the Gaming Commission are its people. Um, I really uh, could go on and on um, because it's always fun to talk about all the positive um, items, but we, we do probably need to get to your thoughts and your goals. But um, I, I would just say that Next year, I'm really hoping that you are able to take on a year of straightforward operations and really be able to build out your team and your organization in a way that serves you well so that you are addressing the, you know, Commissioner Zimica's concern. Um, I know you value responsiveness and I value responsiveness and timeliness. 
there has had to be urgency almost on an everyday basis this year because of the nature of the pandemic and, and other you know, operational necessities. I'm looking forward for a year of not, what do we call it? That I know will never happen, the steady state. state. Yeah. Um, but I am looking forward to you having a year where, you know, going forward where you, you start to build out the, your team, your organization, the way that you know will allow you to achieve the greatest efficiencies and also further the culture that you've identified as, as so important. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to goals. Um, and Commissioner O'Brien, unless you, I, I don't want to jump. No, I think unless if Karen, you don't have to say anything. I think if you want to say something now, feel free, or we can go into summarizing the goals and, and I'll give you a feedback on that. Okay. I mean, I would like to say a couple things. One, um, I am grateful for this opportunity. This has been a, a great opportunity for professional personal development. So I wanted to thank the commissioners for the opportunity. Uh, but above and beyond that, uh, really thank the commissioners uh, for their guidance and support. This has not been an easy year. This was tough. Um, and, and you provided that sense that I wasn't in this by myself. I had a whole team. You were there to help me whenever I needed it and have here to help the whole team. And I think that uh, the entire agency felt that. So I am very grateful for that and wanted to say thank you. Um, and equally, I did want to say that I am extremely grateful for the support from the staff. You know, you're really all, only as good as your team and we have an excellent team here. And I'm so grateful uh, for all the uh, extra effort, all the work that people put in. Uh, and also just the types of people we have here, we had that support with, with, within our teams. And uh, it, was a, it was strangely enough, still a great place to work despite the fact that we're not in the same place. Um, and I felt that among the staff, um, particularly the group that I deal with on a, on a regular basis. We have some incredible people here, so I wanted to say thank you. Um, and I am also want to say thank you for the, the not only the comments today, but also the written um, comments uh, that you submitted because you clearly put a lot of work into it and that means a lot to me. So I want to say thank you for that. Uh, it means a lot. I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for this agency and for the commissioners and the staff. So this is, this, is, this is very touching, you know, just to be able to go through all this. You know, it's one of my, I would say, weaknesses, not super comfortable in the setting with a whole lot of talking to a whole lot of people at the same time. So um, an area I can work on. Uh, so doing it this way is it's, uh, a little overwhelming for me, but uh, I'm very grateful and appreciative. Great. Um, Commissioner Kelly, you wanna go? So I, what I can do is, um, in terms of the goals for next year, the goals in particular, um, maybe we can just go through in the same order. Um, I went through, I thought they were all reasonable, appropriate, timely. Um, the, I do, I'll circle back to the first one because I do want to, I've said this to you already, but I want to, you know, throw out there for, for, for comment and for you to think about part of it. But uh, the review of the procurement process to ensure compliance with best practice and as a mechanism to evaluate ways to increase diversity spend. Uh, I think that's, you know, a, a good thing for us to be looking at. I'm, Enrique and I have probably been saying, you know, procurement and, and you know, audit and stuff since I got here. Um, the only thing that I would say that you might want to think about too is um, when you look at sort of what Joe's shop is right now in terms of the money that we give out through community mitigation, whether there should be also a look at sort of compliance and an audit function on that to see if there's any way there. It's not quite keyed into diversity spend, but it is sort of part of um, procurement review and compliance. Yeah. Um, the second one was completion of pay practice review to ensure compliance with the Massachusetts law and fair compensation scheme. I know you started that. It's one of the things I alluded to having to sort of press pause on for COVID. I do think it's timely now to keep going with that. And then um, I think we all hope that number three would come Forward, which is transitioning back to some level of normalcy, maybe not steady state, you know, as Kathy said, we'll probably never be there, but at least um, we're not quite done yet of having to transition back out of this, um, which, you know, we'll have hiccups in terms of when we go from this to live again, is our equipment going to work? Do we have everything queued up? I mean, it's a good thing to be thinking about now because we are going to have to think about that going forward. Yeah. yeah. Um, so from my point of view, again, other than um, sort of adding food for thought on number one, I think they're all appropriate. Okay. I would, you know, 
concede the floor, I guess, to Commissioner Cameron if she has comments. I do. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree that the goals were all worthy, timely, appropriate um, for this coming year. And the only things that I could add is, you know, very shortly, uh, onboarding a new commissioner that will take a little thought and yeah. uh, i know you're shaking your head like it's you're already thinking about it yeah. how to how to make that person uh, understand all the work that's done and how, how does everybody interact um you know you've been in um karen on a lot of the sports betting that's coming fast and furiously probably so i know that um, you're already formulating how's that going to work how's it going to be integrated all of those things will um, take some time and effort this year. And lastly, um, it looks like, as you know, Karen has jumped right in with me to assist with the um, this international conference that we will be the host agency for in September. It looks like that's going to happen and we'll have more details later, but that will take some time and effort and the right team to make sure that's done properly. Probably a lot smaller than the original numbers, but it does sound like it may still be happening. Um, so I just a few extra things to add to your long, long list, Karen, of, uh, of, uh, of things that are important for this coming year. But I, I, I know that um, you know, you've already said all the important things. You have a great team. So it's really not taking it all in yourself. It's really about, okay, who are the right team members to help me with each of these and commissioners to help with each of these uh, each of these goals. So, good hands. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let, let me uh, follow up on on, on that. And, and I mean, I agree um, with with what's been said uh, in terms of goals with what you articulated. Um, let me mention you you articulating in in, in your evaluation. Um, something in general and i want to put a little specificity specificity to, to it if you if you would allow me you mentioned you know in general to obtain training and resources to increase the effective uh, high level management of the agency which of course um, is, is very appropriate it has many different uh, dimensions perhaps but let me suggest the people process uh, as this area in my mind needs to be thought as a priority given the context that we have been operating under. I think, um, uh, and again, it's, it's, it's gonna get better eventually, but we're not necessarily, <laughs> not meeting in person uh, today, which, uh, which would be nice and, you know, and, and, and who knows when that, that's gonna be restored. And so um, I, I gotta believe that people are doing okay, uh, um, not ideal they're missing certain things there there is a connection through through the zoom uh, you know through hd meeting but it's not quite the same and the longer this goes on the, the more challenging that that um, that that becomes and and um despite all the other um or in addition rather of all these other goals relative to um, whether it's a, a conference or, or, or sports betting or um, an audit and compliance function, uh, all of that is only possible because of, of people, as, as Commissioner Cameron says, of the highly um, great team that, that you have uh, and our ability and their ability, uh, all of us collectively, to continue to do that. Um, and uh, it, it, just in terms of loss of averages and statistics, it's at least conceivable to me that, you know, as, again, as time comes, back, comes, it keeps going, that more, more people might need a little bit more support in one area or another. And that may mean uh, an accommodation of some kind, uh, a flexibility, thinking flexibly about what they do, working with directors and supervisors who, who need to be, perhaps we need to be a bit more proactive in, in teasing out where those areas of focus in terms of people uh, might need. So um, I'm going to stop there, but but I think uh, again that that is a big priority in my mind, just given the context of where where we still are. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, Commissioner Cameron, you have a So um, I agree with everything that has been said. I can um, one thing I can add in with respect to Commissioner Cameron's um, suggestion that the onboarding of a of a new um, 
commissioner, that doesn't lie just with you, that lies with my fellow, myself and fellow commissioners. And, and Karen has organized um, uh, an approach with many team members already starting to really um, uh, gather the materials that will be helpful on that onboarding. And um, will also, of course, have an important role in making sure that uh, a new commissioner feels not only welcome, but well educated and comfortable, particularly as we continue virtually. So um, that's on us as well and, and stay tuned. We'll continue to, to make sure that's a, a well organized and uh, um, intentional effort. So um, in terms of the goals that you listed, Karen, I, I, I see, um, I see in the second one on, on the compensation um, issue, really a reflection of an important value that you promote. And, I, and I, I, I hear you mention this value frequently and that's, it's got to be fair. And, and you, you take that fairness value and you apply that not just in this compensation, um, you know, with respect to compensation issue, but across the board. And that value is one that I think is so important for the morale and health and culture of the organization. So um, I, I, I am pleased that that second goal is, is articulated here. And I know fundamentally um, it's driven by your, your need to make sure that there's a fair structure in place. Um, in terms of procurement, I do think that we've identified that procurement is an area where um, Compliance is, is so important. Um, we expect compliance, full compliance of our licensees. We can expect no less of ourselves. And so procurement is one of those, um, one of the agency's functions that does come with risk and responsibility, particularly as we add the overlay of our need to make sure um, that we are aware of diversity and inclusiveness. Um, so I, I like that you've identified that pro procurement as one of those organizational musts. Um, and I also know that you are prioritizing compliance. And you know, once the agency kind of just ensures that those day-to-day -day public um, operations are fully compliant, then um, it, it's, it's just for you sort of, it just makes your machine so well greased. So procurement is a great one to identify. And then of course, we all hope for the, the transition uh, back. And we know that what that will be isn't really clear yet. And I know that you are aware that that brings anxiety and also some sort of sense of uh, perhaps newness to the, um, uh, to the team members and the organization. So I know that you're staying tuned for that and you're prepared to, to lead that. And, and, I, and I know that again, you're gonna lead that with that sense of fairness in mind. Um, you know, perhaps again, can, can, uh, taking into consideration what Commissioner Zuniga said, that, that health and, and well-being component and uh, also the requirement that the continuing work obligations get fulfilled but in the way that works best for your vision. So I think all three are, are great. If I could have a druther, um, you know, I would have said these, maybe there'd be one kind of global um, goal that you might have. And those are those goals that, you know, when, you're, when your team is taking care of everything, you sort of have that, this is made up, who has that quiet time to just think. But if you did, right, um, you know, what is your, um, what is your, you know, strategy for maybe three years or five years in terms of the objectives. Where would you like to go with the organization? Commissioner Cameron's identified some areas where we might see some new responsibilities. Uh, there, are, there are going to be new responsibilities we can't even think of right now. Um, but uh, your, your strategic plan, if you will, and I use those words very carefully because sometimes strategic planning brings on such a global um, you know, the notion of such global intensity that it can be all consuming. But there's something that I'm trying to identify that's short of that, that's for you, Karen, and your planning. Um, 
that will help you. And, and I think you attach the, your values um, as well as, of course, the agency's values. So that would just have been as an aside on goals if there was you know, sort of three achievable this year and then sort of the longer term goal. Mm -hmm. Say if you could, if you could identify, you know, maybe a few global objectives with three or four um, tactics. And some of these might be tactics that you identify today. So um, okay. I, I, uh, I think you have all of those in your head, um, and it's you identified three really good ones. Uh, and I'm glad that it was three and, and, and not, not more because <laughs> we'd be talking about all of them. But I have such confidence in, in your ability to, to really figure out what's best for the organization short term and then as we move forward. Okay. Thank you. No, the, the feedback's really helpful. Um, you know, and I'm also open for any of the commissioners as time goes on, any other goals or anything that comes up during the course of the year, you know, I, I tend to be a task oriented person. So if there's something the commission wants to do, assign it and, and uh, I'll implement it. So um, that, that's certainly something we can discuss along with myself and the staff working on sort of that forward thinking and what we're looking to do for uh, the next year and the years ahead. The one thing I, I want to add, and it's for my fellow commissioners too, because we don't get a chance to just talk um, because of right. the meeting law. Um, Karen, I have appreciated so much your responsiveness to me. Um, if you, you have understood that I came in the first year, at kind of a point of, of a different type of intensity and crisis and then moved into COVID. And I've had to do a lot of learning through you and a lot of conversations and you have been so accessible to me. With that comes a burden, I know, because there are normally five of us and now four of us. I think you have, um, I, I can't speak for the other commissioners, we don't get to chat with each other about this, but I know that um, you understand and, and are very attuned to the need to keep us apprised. Um, I don't always know what you've apprised the other, the other commissioners of, but I feel that um, very, very comfortable each time we've come into a decision-making uh, situation that I've been um, briefed thoroughly by the team. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are all in agreement with recommendations. I feel like we that you've organized your team to be able to inform us so that we can make the decisions we need to make as commissioners. And that's a difficult, that's not easy. Um, and, and I think because of that, I feel that the commissioners are able to really be productive in this public, this, this difficult public arena. So I want to thank you and I, and I have to, you know, personally extend my thanks for being so generous with your time. Um, and, and, and I know sometimes I more than spontaneous, um, feedback. So with that, I, I want to say very much thank you. And you know, every day for me, I continue to to be so much more and more comfortable with my understanding of of the organization. So that's because of your your willingness to really answer my questions and be responsive. So for that, I'm very grateful. All right. Is there, is there anything else anyone needs from me? I mean, the feedback on the goals is really helpful to me. Uh, any other either questions for me or things um, I can be doing, uh, particularly in the course of the next year? In particular, okay. Eileen, um, are we are we planning on continuing for maybe like a uh, to get on part? Do we do this again in December or do we? What, um, what would the commissioners think about? I mean, if you're going to do it annually and we were going to do calendar, um, then we'd probably be doing this more early January, mid-January. Next year, it would get the entirety of 2021 in. That would be the cadence that I would anticipate. Okay. I like that. Commissioners, do you agree? And, and we agree with the, the yes. form, continuing with the same form at this point? Yeah. Okay. And we can always touch base in the fall and revisit the form. Just make sure nobody's got any thoughts on wanting to change it. Okay, excellent. Um, 
In terms of the uh, issue of compensation, Eileen, Commissioner yeah. O'Brien, how do you want to proceed with that? So I know we're running a little long today and we weren't going to make a decision today. Um, what I can do is give you, um, I had asked Tripti to go back and just give me the historical context for the prior two EDs and, and a sampling of some of the other agencies. It, it was supposed to be in the packet. It's looking like maybe it didn't make it in for some reason. Um, what I can do for you today is just give you a sense of historically where the agency has been and then maybe we can get a little more detail. Tripti and I can go forward and we can have a more in-depth discussion in terms of um, you know, there's sort of two. One is revisiting what sort of the entry base is for this position, regardless of candidate, and then again, having a specific conversation about Karen. Uh, I think we're all mindful too of where we are with the licensees and where the budgets are this year. Um, so I think we had agreed last time that was the way to go. Um, so when I asked Tripti to go back and look, um, it came to my attention that starting with the first executive director who was hired in 2013, and then continuing to the second executive director who was hired in January of 16 and then into Karen right now, they've all been set at the same salary coming in, 185,000 across the board. Um, there, were, there was a merit increase um, for the first executive director and when he departed in September of 15, the base salary had gone up to 190,550. Second executive director, um, and I wasn't. I can't speak to <clears throat> whether there were budget considerations or just, um, you know, philosophical considerations. But there were only one-time bonuses uh, for the second executive director. There was no. Um, so the base when he left in December of last year, or I guess January technically of 2020, was exactly the same, 185. Um, however, there were three one-time bonuses. Uh, about 2,600 in 2016, 3,700 in 2018, and then in the end of 2018, another 5,500. Um, so placing him, you know, close to what the ultimate departing salary was of the first executive director. So that is a salary that eight years in, the entry has been static. Um, according to HR's bans that they create, um, the position could be anywhere from 129,600 um, up to 207 for that 400. So uh, the position, the starting salary we have now is past the midpoint, um, but well within the range um, on the upper limit. Um, she did pull some sample salaries of some other jurisdictions. Some of them are a little outdated, um, and some, but some, you know, 2019, 2020 figures. And they really range from um, anywhere from 120,000 up to um, you know Nevada 274,000. Uh, if you take Nevada out of out of the mix, the next highest would be Pennsylvania at 213. So, do we want to table this discussion and then? Um, revisit compensation in um, at our next meeting and reflect upon this information what would you suggest Commissioner O'Brien I think we had talked about we'd gone kind of a couple different ways I think we landed on that approach at the last agenda setting meeting um, <clears throat> that we would you know think about these numbers and then I know Tripti may have some more information about I don't know whether she's gotten any other numbers in the interim since I asked her to pull this together um, but where we are conceptually, um, and then also putting that in the realm of realistically budget-wise, where are we in terms of um, revenue and the reality of reopening, and what that means in terms of you know making potential adjustments to the position itself, and then relative to Karen, where do we think she should be, and/or when that should be any change should be implemented. Commissioner Cameron? I think that's appropriate to table that until we look at if there's, if there's any um, other numbers out there and just have, having time to be thoughtful about it. Commissioner Seneca? Yeah, um, I'm, uh, that's very helpful summary, by the way, um, Commissioner O'Brien, but um, and, and at that future time, hopefully not too long from now, um, I could also offer my take on some of the historical, you know, some mm -hmm. of the reasons 
it, it was perhaps a mix of uh, philosophical and context, as you point out, um, relative to the decisions to do one-time stuff, uh, perhaps one or two years every time versus uh, increasing the base because that was also part of the context at the time but i think it's it's important to um to come back to this discussion shortly um you know perhaps at, a, at the next or the following commission meeting and then what i can do is just make sure that um the short memo tripty did is disseminated to everyone just as a touch point and then obviously each comparative agency has got its different structure and issues and size and sort of thing to put all those numbers in perspective but i think it'll be helpful Everyone else set then? I guess um, we don't vote. I guess we applaud. <laughs> Too kind. And, and Karen, um, right? Yeah, done. <laughs> Are we done? <laughs> okay. Um, you can just turn your video off soon if you want. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <I'm so> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you again, and, and thank you for your thoughtful work on your um, on your own self-assessment. It was very, very helpful, so thank you. All right, then, should, can we move on then to our next item? I see Commissioner Cameron nodding her head, yes? Okay, good. We're all set then, uh, Karen, we're gonna move on to item number eight, that's uh, uh, General Counsel Grossman, and um, on, uh, I think probably Carrie will be helping, there we, there we are. Yeah, good afternoon again. Let's jump right over to Carrie, who will uh, lead this discussion. Sure. Thank you, Todd. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, we have three administrative changes to some regulations uh, in your packet for you today. These are all to the gaming equipment regulations, 205 CMR 146. Um, there are three separate sections that are within 146, and all of these are in your packet. We have 146.13, that's the regulation related to blackjack table characteristics, 146.49 related to playing cards, and 146.51 related to dealing shoes and automated shuffling devices. So as you recall, the commission clarified the rules of the game of blackjack in the fall by removing references to five blackjack variation. Uh, and at that time, in addition to the rules, the commission updated the regulation relating to the table characteristics for the game, 205 CMR 146.13, to remove those same references in the regulation. Um, when we brought that regulation to you, uh, we made one oversight, um, and we found two additional references in other sections of 146, these two that I've mentioned. Um, that refer to the six to five blackjack variation. So we brought these drafts to you today um, just to clear up those technical changes to make sure that the references are gone and that variation doesn't exist in the rules anymore. Um, so we'd be seeking approval today to begin the promulgation process on these. We can handle this in the ordinary course. We don't need to promulgate by emergency because the rule, excuse me, the variation doesn't exist in the rules, so these, these references in the regs really don't have any effect. It's just a technical cleanup. So do you have any questions on that? Questions? Very clear. Correct? Commissioner O'Brien, I want to make sure. Okay, you're all set then. So uh, I know you're looking for a vote on this. Do we have a yep. motion? Um, for, on the small business impact statement and then on the regs. Thank you. Ma Madam <laughs> Chair, I'd be um, happy to move that the Commission approve the Small Business Impact Statement for 205 CMR 146.13, 205 CMR 146.49, and 205 CMR 146.51, as included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. Okay, any any questions? All right, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes, four zero, Tanya. Commissioner Zuniga. I further move, thank you, Madam Chair, I further move that the commission approve the amendments to 205 CMR 146.13, 205 CMR 146.49, and 205 CMR 146.51, as reflected in the commissioner's packet, 
and authorize staff to take all the steps necessary to begin the promulgation process. Second. Any questions on that? Commissioner Cameron, all set? Okay. All righty. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes, 4 0. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie, for that good work. Thank you. Okay. Now we're approaching our um, item number nine, and we have. Um, Chief Delaney back here um, on uh, the Community Mitigation Application Review. And I see Mary Thurnell is joining us, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Tanya, too. So last thing on the agenda, so I'll try to keep this brief for all of you. <clears throat> um, so in your packets, um, you have a memo dated February 19th that gives, <clears throat> It gives a um, description of all of the, uh, the grant applications that we received um, in this round. But uh, just as a, a brief summary, um, you know, back in November, we issued our final guidelines, mitigation fund guidelines, and went out to um, get requests for responses um, for the community mitigation fund. And those came in on February 1. So um, just so you recollect in 20, for 2021, we established a spending target of $12.5 million for the mitigation fund, $6 million for Region A, $6 million for Region B, and a half a million for the Category 2 facility. Uh, we also set aside some money for the Tribal Gaming Technical Assistance Grant and for the Emergency Mitigation Grants, but those, won't, those don't come up against the $12.5 million target. Um, so that 12 and a half million target remains. Now, in the applications that we received, we got 28 applications on February 1st, totaling about $5.6 million. Now, you'll see that, that both of the, the number of the grants and the dollar figure are down pretty significantly from last year. We had about 30 grant applications, I think, that totaled a little over $13 million in ask last year. Now, granted, we didn't give out that number of grants and that amount of money, um, but it is, a, it is a little bit concerning that the number of grant requests is, is down so significantly. And we're trying to sort of put our finger on why that might be. Um, and, and, you know, and there's, a, there's a bunch of possibilities there. Part of it could just be due to COVID, you know, that, that these communities don't have the bandwidth to be doing applications right now or just you know, may not even be really that interested in it. They have far more hyper-local kind of things to deal with. Um, that certainly could be the case. Um, you know, the, um, um, you know um, one of the things we, we talked about also was that, um, you know, we are also encouraging everyone to try to spend down their old money that they had so last year when we went through the grant applications, we had communities that were asking for another round of funding and they hadn't spent their old money yet. So we're saying to some of them like, you know, put the brakes, tap the brakes here a little bit and maybe hold off on applying until you spend down some of that money. We can't just keep giving grants and having them sort of build up. So that's another possible reason. And then the other, the other reason that has been ongoing is that, um, sometimes these communities have difficulty making that nexus to an impact of the casino. And we've talked about this, I think, at, at some length with all of the commissioners over time. You know, the, the way that the, um, the law was set up, it says that, that these funds have to be used to offset the costs associated with the construction or operation of the casino. And in some cases, it's hard to make that direct connection. You know, I think we know we. I think we can all say with a pretty high degree of certainty, if there's a huge increase in traffic on an intersection, we know that there's a cost associated with that, with bigger traffic tie-ups, more gas being burned, worse pollution. There's a whole lot of things that go along with that. Although it's kind of hard to put your finger on the exact cost, we know there is a cost, and everybody can sort of, you know, connect those dots. On some of these other projects, it's a little less um, finite, the, uh, the connection. So 
you know, some of the things we've been thinking about and, and, and talking about is, you know, is there a way that we can maybe try to expand the eligibility for some of these uh, grants to include, um, you know, trying to take advantage of the presence of the casino, trying to leverage that to improve things in their town. Now, like an example would be, um, you know, if a town was saying, hey, we know that there's, you know, 10,000 people a day are showing up at the MGM or the Encore Casino or whatever the, whatever the magic number is, that's just a, you know, a fictional number. How do we attract them to our community? You know, could we fix up our downtown somewhat? You know, could we do some streetscape work? Could we do this? Could we do that to make it more attractive for people to come to our town so we can attract more businesses and more restaurants and maybe get some of these folks to come to our town? You know, under our current rules, that's not really doable, even though it would be a great use of use of that money. So um, just want to throw that out there as food for thought. And, and uh, Chair and I have had some conversations about this. And, you know, it would take a legislative change to allow some of that, some of those kinds of things to happen. But it might be worth starting that discussion. Now, look, I'm not saying that, um, you know, the, the sky is falling because our applications are down this year. Um, you know, they could jump right back up next year. I don't, you know, who knows. Um, but I think we do need to think about a little bit more long term about the, the fund and, and how, how we're going to try to best utilize these funds for the communities in and around the casinos. So um, I'm not going to go into obviously into the, um, the specific applications that we received. Those are all in your memo. One of the things we did this year um, was we did ask all of our applicants to give us a brief description of their projects, so that uh, which they did, which makes it a lot easier for us to put these memos together for you, um, and also helps us with some of our, you know, when we do um, uh, some public outreach on these things, it gives us a little more succinct uh, description. So I think you can read those at your leisure, and um, I guess with that, I mean that's that's generally the summary of where we are. Uh, the next few months, you know, March will be reviewing all of the applications and meeting with the review team. April is where we do sort of the outreach to the uh, applicants if we have specific questions um, regarding the applications. May is where we do our final evaluations. Um, and then June, we typically come to the commission for our, for our great big uh, community mitigation fund meeting uh, where we go through these. Um, Mary has a great idea that, um, we, that as a group we need to talk about since money is really not an, a particular issue this year, we thought we might be able to even just break these up by category and bring them to, commission, to the commission more piecemeal rather than having this you know, giant marathon session. I want to talk about that with the review team and see what everybody thinks about that and then bring that to the commission as a possibility. You know, for instance, next week we're reviewing uh, workforce applications. If we can get with those folks and get our questions answered, maybe we could come in April to, to just do workforce and get that out of the way. Um, you know, maybe we can do transportation another day and so on. Um, so that's a thought that we have uh, going forward. But, you know, as always, our target is to get this done by the end of June, as we have in the past, and uh, you know, keep the process moving forward. I guess with that, I will open it up um, for any questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Joe. That's a, that's a great summary. And, um, and let me let me just go back to uh, a couple of the points you made towards the beginning of your remarks relative to the overall view, if you will, of the program. Um, I agree with you that um, there's a number of things that uh, we might be observing with this decreased a uh, number of requests and monies, including you know this unusual year and the effort to try to get um, people to spend down their first appropriations, not you know not just keep keep renewing the requests, as well as the potential for certain of these things just not being that easy or related, frankly, to the easy to relate or really um, related to the impacts from the casino. Um, let me just add one more on, on that, and, 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 and that's, that's really a little food for thought given this discussion. 
for you know for, for perhaps these next guidelines, but for perhaps this year. Um, and that is that we have placed limits, appropriate limits, I might add, in terms of either monetary limits or percent participation limits in each one of in each each of these grant categories. Um, and, and it's at least conceivable to me that we are seeing the numbers we're seeing also probably because of those limits, that there may be more scope that we never get to see because, well, uh, communities are only allowed to submit one application per category per community, or that in certain categories, we're not gonna fund more than X amount of money or other larger projects, we're not gonna fund, you know, we expect a, a third to, to, to at a maximum fund a third. Uh, so those would be areas for us to, to, to kind of look at um, as we continue to think, as, as you correctly point out, to think creatively whether we should expand to other things like uh, taking advantage of a casino rather than just mitigating costs. Still in the mitigating arena, there may be a case to be made to, to, uh, to increase some of those funding levels. Having said all that, um, I'm reminded of what I think is a fundamental dilemma to this program, which is that perhaps the things that the casino does um, uh, contribute more directly to, um, especially in Region A, frankly, are traffic issues. And, uh, you know, when it comes to Angkor and traffic, everybody thinks of Sullivan Square. And in that realm, we can, we, we, we're not able to, to fund anything close to what might be needed. Um, and that's why then, you know, a lot of these limits are relevant. Um, and, and as well as the casino has a huge um, role to play there. But importantly, you know, meaningful changes to, to, um, to addressing those issues um, require many, many other stakeholders and resources. And th that, that gets me to the dilemma, if you will, that in the absence of being able to address big things like that, um, because we're not funding, we're, we're not committing to multi-year uh, projects uh, or, 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 or the like, um, we're left with, you know, uh, perhaps uh, uh, um, more of an amount of grants, um, smaller grants distributed for, for other kinds of projects. So um, I don't have any answers now. I'm just saying this is this is clearly something that we need to be thinking as we continue to see these levels of requests and interest. But we know that there's that other big one over there, which is traffic and 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 you know and, and construction projects related to traffic, that that you know we cannot fund alone. Yeah, I agree with everything that you've just said. <laughs> I um, want to point out that I thought um, I got to attend at least one, if not two, of the workshops, uh, Joe, that you and, and Mary and Tanya hosted for um, applicants. Um, I understand the feedback was positive. A really important outreach to, to give guidance to, to make sure that there's not um, friction on the application side. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, as one, you alluded to the discussions I've had with you around whether there could be some further clarification from the legislature as to their intent. Um, you know, you look at the language and it does say offset costs associated with construction or operational casino, you know, in some ways, where um, opportunity costs are also there, you know, where where you talk about leverage, if, if they don't have the means to take advantage of, of um, you know, the, to to as you say, perhaps beautify their streets or add some kind of a um, a, a park or something that could be a feature to attract uh, tourists who are who are um, going to the casinos. Then there's an opportunity cost. We don't ever want to be cute with our statutory interpretation, uh, but I think that um, as we explore the what Commissioner Zuniga just outlined, the opportunity you know make sure that we're not we're not um, erecting unnecessary barriers, right? 
at the same time, um, you know, is there an opportunity to see if, if there's a way to mitigate the loss of, of um, opportunity because of just lack of funding? So, um, you know, something for maybe uh, us to think about with our new legislative director um, uh, going forward. <clears throat> um, I think I had one other point, I don't want to lose it. Um, and it had to, oh, I know, it had to do with the guidelines, and, I'm, and forgive me, I, again, I'm having a hard time remembering the sequence, but would there, to, to Commissioner Zuniga's point, if we were establishing barriers, is there an opportunity for us to have maybe a, a public comment um, period where we, we um, invite, uh, I know that you do this on, you know, in your small groups and you get input from um, your local committees, but I wondered if we, if there's an opportunity down the road to do like a, you know, a, a public forum to see where communities, um, if they're aware of the program and then if there are in fact barriers that they're either the, the lack of just even the getting to the application to your point earlier, uh, Joe, or if it's, you know what, we can never come up with that extra, you know, two thirds of the, of the budget. It's just too much of a barrier. I don't know if that's been thought about just a big round table public forum in the past, but I, I think I, I would benefit from it as a commissioner who doesn't work closely on the review process. Something to think about. Yeah, we, you know, we do open up the guidelines for public comment, um, but, you know, quite frankly, <laughs> I, you know, the next time we see public comment might be the first time. Yeah, uh, that's that's probably not true. I'm, I'm sure we I'm sure we've gotten some comments on the guidelines, but it's not a whole lot from the public. Um, so, you know, that could be an opportunity to have a, a public hearing, a roundtable of some sort to to just invite. Um, you know, look, obviously we have our local community mitigation advisory committees and those are supposed to be the folks that are sort of getting us this information and, 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 and that kind of thing. And, and maybe that can be sort of the focus of those meetings in the fall is saying, um, look, we've, we've been running this program for, for five or six years now. It's doing what it's doing. You know, what are some of the other opportunities that we could try to, try to get at? You know, and try to get input from the communities ahead of time, saying this is these are the topics we want to discuss with you, and we really want your input from your communities. Saying what are the barriers to getting these grants? What are the kinds of things you would like to spend this grant money on? You know, and with that said, you can't necessarily spend it on everything they want to spend the money on. But um, you know, I think that might be a, a good way to start the conversation. I think it's a great idea to um, to do you know to expand the feedback uh, you know do more outreach uh, in addition to the local community mitigation and advisory committees um, you know and then and you know we don't we don't have to do it only once we don't have to wait to the next year perhaps to um, to formulate the guidelines um, and you know I'm sure we will benefit from um, you know from and we are also trying to set, we are also trying to set up um, local uh, community mitigation and the subcommittee meetings again in April you know, or this spring. Um, so, you know, at least if we can get one meeting this spring with everyone, we can maybe tee those things up and saying, hey, this is what we want to focus on in the fall. And maybe, you know, you can spend the next couple of months talking to your communities, your town planners, your, you know, whoever whoever is you know trying to get these grants on what what would what would work better i know too um commissioner zuniga i believe you attended the gpac session and yes. i know that the, the members there are expressing interest in hearing more so and of course there are legislators on that committee as well as key stakeholders so I, i'm sure um the chair of that committee is likely to put Joe and uh, Mary and Tanya's work uh, on the agenda. So again, more input from them as well. So, okay. 
Anything uh, I, on, on this um, item A, anything further? And everybody's had the chance to, or if you haven't, to go through the list. We've got now a working list of the applications. Thank you so much uh, to Mary and Tanya and Joe for that. And that was included in the packet. All right, should we move on to item B? Are, are we all set for that? Okay, thank can, you. Can I okay. summarize perhaps what may have been just a tacit or implicit agreement? Um, if we come back with, um, if Joe and Mary come back with uh, perhaps recommendations by category um, rather than one or two marathon sessions as, as in the past to do this review, I, I personally think it would be, um, would be more preferable. You know, I have to say that I really love marathon sessions. <laughs> <laughs> We've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe, with that, you know, um, I think it's a brilliant idea. Mary gets full credit for it, I think. Right, Joe? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. With Commissioners uh, O'Brien and Commissioner Cameron, do you want the marathon session or the one that's efficient and short and targeted? Good way to describe it. Uh, <laughs> no, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I just want to thank Joe and the team for, you know, not being in that status quo mode, always thinking of ways to improve the program. So it's noted and, and appreciated. So thank you. And let's not put too fine a point on it. Some of this may be a little marathon-y. <laughs> <Still. laughs> it's like a half marathon. Though. Yeah. <laughs> the, the book is this big. So, right? right? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I think that really is a great idea. So um, with that, we'll just, uh, as we go through our agenda setting, we'll, we'll work with you to, to whatever works best for how you want to present to us. We look forward to it. Great. Okay, so moving on to the city of Medford. Um, let me give you a little bit of background on this. Um, Medford got transportation planning grants from us back in 2016 and 2017. And you know, 2016 was the first year that we did these things. We got kind of applications that were all over the board. People had lots of great ideas, didn't necessarily know quite how to implement them. Um, you know, we, we were all sort of learning as we went along. Um, so over time, uh, you know, some of these grants have, have kind of laid fallow a little bit and, and the spending hasn't necessarily gotten done in them um, as, as we had hoped. Uh, but talking about that first Medford grant, we gave them a grant award for up to $260,000. The first piece of it was to hire a transportation planner and also to hire a transportation consultant to help them out. And then the third piece of it was they, they got a federal earmark to do a study on water transportation options on the Mystic and Malden rivers. And the money that we were giving them was going to be matching funds that they needed to get that grant going. So what ended up happening, you know, originally this transportation planner, um, you know, one of the things that Encore was required to do was give a million dollars to MassDOT to do a study on the long-term impacts at Wellington Circle, or I should say for a long-term solution to Wellington Circle. And that money was given to uh, MassDOT and um, uh, only very recently have they sort of cut that loose to, to, to start that study. And MAPC is involved in the whole, whole bunch of people involved, including the cities. But originally they thought that that transportation planner and consultant would be working on this Wellington study that has only just started back, it started last fall, late last fall. So, Needless to say, they didn't really uh, spend much of that money. They did spend a little over 19000 on on a transportation consultant, um, which helped them out on a few things. But one of the problems that they had with hiring of the transportation planner was sort of the requirement that this person spend all of their time on gaming-related uh, work, and the fact that they would have to certify to that. And you know, the, the city was saying, we, we can't really hire someone and guarantee that all of their time is going to be spent on gaming related stuff. So anyways, long story longer, um, they didn't, they weren't able to hire the transportation planner and they only spent a portion of their money on the um, 
transportation consultant. With the water study, again, one of those things to make that nexus to the casino, um, this water study originally was going to be just looking at the Baldwin and Mystic Rivers and, and sort of shuttling people around in the community from station landing up to some of those new developments further north on the Malden River and, and, and to the downtown. And we said, well, if, if we're going to be providing funds for this, it has to have something to do with the casino. So we required that, that this um, study include a stop at the casino where we thought, hey, they're doing water transportation to Boston. If we could get you know, additional uh, stuff up to Malden, that would be great. Well, apparently, you know, the scope of this work had been settled and when they went back to, I, I can't remember which agency it was who was doing this, uh, which federal agency, um, they didn't want to see the scope changed and so on. And, you know, and since that time, there's been changes in administration, in the community, and essentially this really isn't high on their priority list. And, you know, quite frankly, I think we were a little dubious going in that this would result really in a whole new ferry system that would that would provide a you know sort of a cost effective way of getting back and forth to the casino um, but hey well if we were willing to give it a shot as long as there was a connection to the casino so really on that first grant of 260,000 there's a little over almost 241,000 left in that grant that was on spent um, a second grant was given to Medford to do uh, a study of the South Medford con connector and to hire a contract planner. Um, the $20,000 for the contract planner was never, that person was not hired. So there's a $20,000 um, balance in that grant. So what, um, what Medford is asking for is to, for that um, total amount, which is a little over almost $261,000, um, to be put towards a, a different grant that um, is underway. So um, in 2019, we gave Medford a grant to, to do a, um, the planning and design of a, a boardwalk that would pass underneath Route 28 along the Mystic River, creating a connection between a couple of bike paths. And if, just bear with me for a moment. I think um, this, uh, I'm gonna share just a uh, map of the area so you can see what we're talking about here and, and, and why this connection is really uh, fabulous. So what they're proposing right here is Route 28, the Fells Way. Um, and this boardwalk is going to go out actually over the water, underneath the bridge and over. And you can see the network of paths on both sides of that. So right now, if somebody wants to cross over, they have to come up, walk down the sidewalk, cross over at a set of lights over six lanes of roadway um, or cross illegally here over four lanes of roadway, a very busy roadway. So now you'll see on the other side of the river, this is exactly what they did on the other side of the river. Here is, this is essentially what they want to do. This side of the river. Oops. Oh. That's not is a you know I got a photo here of the boardwalk. There we go. This photo is a little bit dark, but you can see there is a bike path on the other side out over the river. And essentially what they want to do is mirror that on the other side. Now, the other thing you'll notice here, so you see all of the bike, the paths through here, paths through here. We just funded last year with one of our construction grants, closing this piece of bike path along the Malden River. And closing this in would basically mean you have a direct connection that goes all the way here, Malden River, connecting over into here and taking you right to the casino. So, you know, we, we really love this project. Obviously we funded the, the initial study of this, which was $200,000. Now, what we did, um, and in your packet, there's some cost estimates and other things. What, what they would do with these funds is um, be able to get this, and with another, they, they, they've applied for a grant from the Mass Trails Project, 
And that would be able to bring this project to 100% design. Now MassDOT, because they own Route 28, and DCR owns some of the properties around it, have been involved with this thing all the way through. And while there's no guarantees, um, it looks very, very favorable that this boardwalk will be funded through the State Transportation Improvement Program. So again, this is that sort of opportunity to leverage Gaming Commission funds to get other state funds to build the thing. So, you know, chances are they won't be coming back to us to build this, they'll be going to, to MassDOT. So, you know, we look at this as, you know, those other studies, you know, the, transport, the, the water study is probably not gonna happen. So we think it's perfectly appropriate to reallocate these funds to this 2019 project. It'll get it all the way through 100% design um, and uh, ready for construction. And, um, you know, they're applying already with MassDOT and, you know, all indications are that this project should be eligible and we'll probably get state funding to build it. So our recommendation, and we do need a motion on this, I realize that we didn't uh, prepare a motion for you, but we're recommending that the $260,806.80 be reallocated to the Wellington from the 2016 to 17 grants to be reallocated to the Wellington Route 28 underpass project. And with that, I will open up for any questions. Um, not a question, just a comment that I, I couldn't agree more with the recommendation. Um, I think you lay out all the reasons why, uh, why I think it, this would be a good reallocation of funds especially if you in the context of your initial presentation um, which touched on uh, you know our early uh, lessons and our, our desire to get some of these early funding um, that uh, unspent money is uh, resolved so this is a, a, a great opportunity to actually uh, getting uh, leveraging as you say by, by, by funding this project to making something um, See something happen. I, I agree. Appropriate use for the money. Very thorough. Commissioner O'Brien? No, I like it. I like the closing of the loop. I like the little yellow person going along. I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there should be a biker one, uh, you yeah. know, in the future. Uh, yeah, that's right. right. It, it yeah. must be 3 p.m., right? Um, the entertainment was needed. Actually, that, that was really, really helpful to see the visuals, so thank you. Very convincing and seems just right. Do we have a motion? Uh, I'm happy to make that motion. I move that the balance of the funds totaling 260806 and 80 cents previously granted to the City of Medford for transportation planning in 2016 and 17 be reallocated to the 2019 grant for the Wellington Route 28 underpass project as described in the materials in the commissioner's packet and as discussed today, and further authorize staff to execute the amendment to the applicable, applicable grant instruments to reflect the change as necessary. Second. Thank you. Any further questions for Joe? A excellent pivot, I feel. Um, so thank you. Um, Everyone's all set then. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, 4 0. Thanks, Tanya. All right. Um, hey, before we go to the next item, I just, uh, I, I had thought I had seen it, but I wasn't sure where. But uh, Jamie just sent an email reminding us that. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien summarized the history on compensation, and it is in our materials. I wasn't sure if it come through an email to me, but it is on page 45 of the materials. So, uh, you know, for going forward for our next session, when we do address the ED's compensation, it's right there. So thank you. Um, so uh, I think we're all set then with respect to uh, Joe's work. And, yes, thanks. Um, we're all, we're all set. You're all set. And, and a big, big thank you to your team, um, Mary, Tanya. And I know that Crystal and, and Jill provide a lot of support too, as well as Commissioner Zuniga. So thank you very, very much. Um, 
We'll move on then to the, the last item on the agenda, uh, commissioner updates. Does anybody have one? No. I alluded to one that I would have provided, which is on the onboarding of a, you know, a future commissioner. So um, Karen, we'll just wanna make sure we orchestrate the approach because I think I said in our last meeting, perhaps Commissioner Zunica, you were with it, it was in the HR discussion, that we would go to the, each commissioner to see um, you know, what's being accumulated, what would you add in, and then what would you want to do just to make sure that all of us are included in ensuring a, a really smooth transition for yes. the new company. Yep, that's the plan. Okay, so excellent. That's all I was gonna um, mention. Anything else? Todd, how are you doing? <laughs> all right. <That's> <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, then if there's no other business, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just going to look. I know we have had, you know, we we still have 30 team members on a very long day. Important um, and diverse matters. Thank you for everyone. Thank you to our guests who came, um, to those who who were responsible for the guests. Make sure that they hear our thanks. And uh, unless there's something else, commissioners, is there anything you want to add other than be safe, everyone? No, thank you, everyone. Um, you know, we have a town uh, meeting tomorrow and a speaker, so looking forward to that. Emphasis on the speaker. We're really looking forward to the speaker and we're looking forward to seeing everyone's faces. Let's pretend we're there arriving in person and we don't care if your hair isn't done or you're, you've got laundry in the background or anything. We just would love to see your faces. Commissioner Cameron? I don't have anything to add, but I would um, I would uh, provide a motion to adjourn. No way, Commissioner Bryan. <laughs> I <expect> All right. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Yeah. Um, any further comments or questions on the motion to adjourn? All right, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner Bryan. Aye. Commissioner Zinica. Aye. And I vote yes. Tanya, thank you so much, and and Todd, thank you. Karen, thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye.